Good evening. Welcome. I uh, call this meeting to order the Dr. Cog Board of Directors for Wednesday, January 17th. If you are a uh, voting member, if you take a seat at this front area, uh, and we'll get started. If you are able, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Great. Welcome. We have a ton of new folks tonight, so want to want to acknowledge uh, some of our, our new folks uh, that may be here, some may not be, but want to recognize uh, our new members, Terrence Kelly from the City of Sheridan. And if you're here, raise your hand. Welcome. <laughs> Greg Mills from the City of Brighton. <laughs> Steve Douglas, City of Commerce City. We'll still give Steve applause, you know? Somewhere he'll know that's happening. Commissioner Andy Kerr of Jefferson County. Yay. Brian Wong from the city of Lafayette. Welcome. Uh, former alternate that has moved into the, uh, the, the board position. And Angela Lawson from the city of Aurora. We are thrilled to have all of you here. Welcome. Uh, new alternates make mention of these. Uh, Justin Martinez from the city of Thornton is an alternate. He will be moving into the board position. Welcome. Uh, Tara Bider Fleur from the city of Sheridan, alternate. Uh, well, just to, just to keep it up, I, I don't want to. I don't want to be rude to anybody. Uh, Aaron Rodriguez from the city of Longmont is an alternate. Uh, David Friedland from the city of Lafayette. Uh, Lisa Vitry from the city of Golden. Chris Fielder from the city of Brighton. And our uh, final alternate, uh, well, actually, we've got two more. Uh, Allison Coombs from the city of Aurora, who will be rejoining us as the alternate to uh, Angela. And from the city of Inglewood, Kim Wright. So awesome, lots of, lots of new names, lots of new people. Uh, with that, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, do wanna mention, if you haven't been here before, restaurant, I feel like a flight attendant. Restrooms are in the hallway, coffee's in the hallway, cookies are in the hallway, help yourself to all of that. Uh, if you parked in the garage downstairs, Ms. Stevens will have the uh, parking passes to, to you can get before you leave tonight. Uh, also, your name tags or your name signs, if you could, be sure it's facing me. Uh, just because you know your name, I may not. So uh, if it's facing me, that's going to be easier as we call uh, on folks tonight through the conversation. So thank you. Uh, a quick reminder that for in-person meetings, the member or alternate, if the member is not present for each jurisdiction, sits at the main table. Any additional attendees are asked to sit at the row of tables in the back. So if you're an alternate and your main member is here as well, uh, it would be the member that would sit at these tables and the alternate would be in the gallery. Uh, Dr. Cog board meeting are in person. In September of 2023, the board adopted a restricted hybrid policy, which you may review at the Dr. Cog website or reach out to Melinda for information regarding the policy. If you've not notified the chair or, or executive director prior to this meeting and have joined this meeting virtually, you will not be able to participate, uh, but are welcome to view and listen to the meeting. So a little bit of housekeeping there. Uh, I understand there's one more bit of housekeeping. George Teal, I understand it's your birthday. I assure you the 30s are not that bad, so you'll be fine. So welcome and congratulations. I've been there. <laughs> I'm almost up to 20. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for being here. With all of, of that uh, pre-information, pre precursor uh, done, we will ask for the official roll call. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, here we go. Steve Odoricio, Adams County. Perfect. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Glad to be here. Claire Levy, Boulder County. Here. Austin Ward, City and County of Broomfield. Here. Randy Wheelock, Clear Creek County. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. 
Nicholas Williams, Denver. Kevin Flynn, Denver. Here. George Teal, Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. Happy birthday. Murray Mornis, so Gilpin County. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andy Kerr, Jefferson County. Here. Lisa Ferre, City of Arvada. Here. Angela Lawson, Aurora. Here. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Royce Pindell, Bennett. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Present. Margot Ramsden, Bomar. Greg Mills, Brighton. Here. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Jason Gray, Castle Rock. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Todd Williams, City of Central. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Happy to be here. Steve Douglas, Commerce City. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Here. Othaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Here. Ari Harrison, Erie. Sarah Laughlin, Erie. Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Lisa Jones, Foxfield. Wendy Padilla, Frederick. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Rich Barrows, Georgetown. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Ryan Tushare, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. George Lance, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Deslin Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. Isaac Levy, Larkspur. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kat Bristow, Lockbuie. Jacqueline White, Lockbuie. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Joan Peck, Longmont. Here. Judy Kern, Louisville. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Greg Edding, Lyons. Here. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Richard Condo, North Glen. Here. John Dyack, Parker. Here. Terrence Kelly, Sheridan. Here. Neil Shaw, Superior. Sandy Hammerly, Superior. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. Sarah Nermella, Westminster. Bud Starker, Wee Ridge. Darius Pakbaz, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. And standing in for Brian Welch this evening, Bill Saroy of RTD. All right, Mr. Chair, with that, we do have a quorum. Thank you very much. Uh, one thing I wanted to call out real quick, Jessica Sangren, uh, who has been here for six years. This is her final meeting. And we want to thank you for all of your service to Dr. Cog and being a part of the conversation. And you've been just a, a great member of the Dr. Cog board. So Jessica, thank you so much. Uh, with that, we'll move, we'll move ahead to item number four, which is the agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I have a motion, uh, second. I heard a second there somewhere. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? We have an agenda. Thank you very much. With that, we will move ahead to our strategic informational briefing. Mr. Rex, uh, away you go with item number five, housing-related legislation for 2024. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, it's our pleasure this evening to have members of the governor's uh, office staff here, and they're making their way forward. I'm going to try to drag this as long as I can. Oh, they're going to give us, a, as, as many of you know that we're on the board, um, they gave us an update in at the November board work session, I believe, about the, the status of some upcoming our proposed uh, housing bills, and they're here to provide you with an update this evening. So I'll let them introduce themselves, and then uh, they'll get going. Hi, everyone. My name is Lenny Angelitas, and I'm the Governor's Special Housing Advisor and Deputy Legislative Director. I'll let, we'll intro in them. Uh, John Moore, Policy Advisor, Covered Transportation, Land Use, and Environmental Issues. Ethan Lindquist, I'm a senior land use planner at CDOT and uh, kind of on loan for this project with the Gov team. All right, well, really good to see everybody. Thanks for having us. Um, really excited for this discussion. And as I've, I think, said multiple times to various parties, this isn't the end of the discussion. Um, we'll make ourselves available in any way, um, in any way possible throughout session and, and ongoing with these discussions. And really appreciate the partnership and collaboration thus far. Oh, I, the up and down arrow? Okay. <laughs> Technology.
technology is not my thing, but housing is. So um, I think just really quick to, to table set, I think last year, of course, you know, 213 was very broad. It was sweeping. And I think just wanted to, I, I think a lot of you have seen this slide before, but just to kind of set the stage, I think in response to a lot of feedback last year of building in more incentives and building in more resources for local governments, I think we're trying to take more of an approach of building in some of those resources, knowing that um, zoning is a barrier, but it's not the only barrier. And so the governor's budget did include a lot of different resources as it relates to housing, including tax credits, um, a TOD infrastructure fund, and so forth, um, which we'll get into in the later slides as we talk about the legislation. So these are these have really been um, the three focus areas of, there's eight bills, but these are really the, the three focus um, bills. The other pieces of legislation are more focused on um, OEDIT agenda items and so forth, so we can get into those later. Um, but strategic growth, ADUs um, paired with some innovative financing, and then our transit-oriented communities legislation. And just to kind of kick us off here, and I know that there's, there have also been discussions with um, other partners at CML on strategic growth and the local housing needs assessments and regional housing needs assessments. So this has been a focus that was actually present in the bill last year um, that we're still very interested in pursuing, I think, especially because the components listed here on the local housing needs plans, the statewide housing analysis, um, and really the need to better integrate our housing and transportation planning is kind of a key framework that the state lacks in terms of taking a step back and actually being able to evaluate um, our affordable housing crisis from region to region, knowing that there's different challenges in each community. Uh, we've, we've funded actually a lot of local efforts through 1271 and other efforts, um, but we really see this as a critical framework um, that helps complement existing efforts at the local level. I think, you know, Dr. Cog, you're engaging in a regional housing needs assessment also. So this is more of just, I think, kicking off. We still see the value of smart planning and some of these um, capturing these demographics so that we can better align our state resources and better align policies that, that complement local jurisdictions efforts. And I will kick it over to, uh, or sorry, <laughs> John to talk about ADUs. Um, the one thing I'll just note on this is we also have a flow chart that we can send out. Um, I think it's captured in this slide that kind of walks through if you're a subject jurisdiction and how to opt into some of those financial resources. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as Lenny said, I, I mean, a key part of all the, the bills this session are trying to build on a lot of the good work that local communities have been doing in this regard. And I think when we last checked in with you in November, I, I think there was a lot of recognition that many communities that, that would be um, uh, part of this already allow ADUs to some extent either fully by right in some areas of the city or with some restrictions on it. Um, one of the things that we've really been trying to do is take a look at what other states and regions have been doing, particularly on um, to see what works to get more ADUs built. And I, I, I mentioned before, I uh, previously joined the governor's office. I was a city planner at the city of Arvada, um, and Arvada has had a, a fairly permissive ADU policy for a long time, but hadn't seen a lot of uptake in ADUs because there are significant barriers to construction, uh, financing, and, and things like that. What a lot of other regions have really seen when they've implemented some of these policies is when you create standardized um, requirements throughout a region, that's when financial institutions like banks, credit unions, uh, local community banks can actually build products to allow uh, average homeowners to be able to access. Right now, with having kind of a patchwork of regulations, most financing uh, institutions just see it as too much of a risk. They're, they're never really sure that, that anyone's be, going to be able to uh, complete uh, building an ADU. And so those financing products are just kind of out of reach for most homeowners. So that's the overarching goal of this is to try and recognize what a lot of communities have already been doing and find ways to, to create these standard requirements. So um, the basic criteria would be any municipalities within uh, metropolitan planning organizations, over 1,000 people, or um, pieces of counties within MPOs that are census designated places over 10,000 people um, would be required to meet these uh, criteria. And then any other jurisdictions that want to opt in to access the grants and financing can do so um, as long as they meet the uh, criteria. Um, the, the kind of standard requirements that we're looking for is to ensure that uh, homeowners can build reasonably sized ADUs, so they have to be uh, 
jurisdictions have to allow ADUs to be constructed between 500 and 800 square feet. Um, they can't require occupancy restrictions, and that's one of, been one of the biggest um, barriers that we've heard from AARP and, and a lot of other organizations, that occupancy restrictions really prohibit the ability for homeowners to get financing and then um, not require extra parking spaces. Again, a homeowner can build a parking space if they want, but a local jurisdiction can't require it as part, as part of an ADU. And then lastly, just um, making sure that any design requirements and things like that aren't more restrictive than single family home requirements. Um, so if there are certain design requirements that the main home has to meet, the ADU can also meet those, but just making sure that um, there aren't uh, more expansive requirements beyond that. Um, again, just making sure, uh, hitting on the flexibility, those are the baseline requirements. Nothing would prevent uh, local governments from being able to regulate short-term rentals, allow uh, parking for ADA and, and some of these are, um, other requirements. Anything in a historic district would still have to follow historic district standards um, and things like that. Um, as far as the eligibility for grants and financing, um, there is a, a bit of a strategy just to make sure that there are, there's um, uh, awareness and thoughtfulness around uh, efficiency and, and affordability. So um, for local governments to be eligible for the financing, they have to meet the base criteria and also have some additional uh, things around pre-approved plans, um, incentivizing affordability, having a ADU technical assistance program, uh, you know, either staff or website kind of dedicated for information sharing. And again, there's a lot of communities have been putting these resources together. So our, I think the hope is to encourage uh, more to do that. As far as the, the uh, grants and financing themselves, fee reduction would be based around um, things like additional water or sewer tap fees. Um, if, if there's uh, infrastructure requirements that are kind of part of an ADU, um, jurisdictions that either waive some of those fees or, or reduce them or subsidize them will be eligible to receive uh, some backfilling from the state to support those products. And then um, uh, for the homeowners, uh, financing to facilitate construction of ADUs, working with TRAFA to work on uh, uh, interest rate buy-downs uh, to help kind of get into that entry point in, in financing while um, uh, the marketing and banks can uh, more of the market products um, as this is stabilized throughout the region. As Ani mentioned, this is kind of the overall ADU flowchart. can leave this here for a second, but I think you'll all receive this in packets and kind of walk through and see how this works. Um, and again, if you have any questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out to any of us. We're always happy to answer questions. Okay, go for it. One quick thing on, I think, what was on our previous slide around the financing. So part of the legislation is also just structured, of course, like the fee reduction grant program, as John mentioned. But that second piece that, that John mentioned around CHAFA, really partnering with them to help better create um, you know, options for an interest rate buy down, a loan loss reserve fund. They have expertise. They've done that before, um, it, even in partnership with OEDIT and with the treasurer's, the treasurer's office. So we see that as a critical piece because I do think in a lot of the policy conversations that we had last year, um, you know, you can allow ADUs, but if you don't have some of those financing options that actually make it within reach for homeowners, you're not going to really see an uptick. And so we really want to kind of bring this innovative uh, product um, with CHAFA in partnership with them to bring more lenders and credit unions and other people to the table. There's been really great success, even just on a small scale um, here in West Denver um, with their pilot program where they've partnered with like banks to provide uh, low interest construction loans, um, especially prioritizing low and moderate um, income homeowners. So we see that as crucial to the policy of yes, some policy reform, but also that financing to actually pair together nicely. Um, and the last thing I'll just mention, we've taken, I think, a lot of really best practices from a lot of you in this room and other um, cities throughout the state in terms of the modeling of, of how this could work. All right, so for the uh, transit oriented communities bill, I'll, I'll just mention, as John said, you. We've got a lot of details on these slides. This is way too many details for a 15 minute presentation, but we kind of purposely did not give you the shortened version because we want to be able to send you the packet afterwards so you have all the details um, as much as we can give you in the bill. And also, particularly with the change oriented communities, um, we've really enjoyed talking to probably about 10 ish or so uh, cities in the Dr. Krog region's planning staff and really trying to help each other understand where different cities are at in meeting the transit oriented community goal, uh, the goals of this bill. And so we'll just really extend that invitation to anybody else. Once you get this, this will include kind of a step-by-step -step, um, of how to 
calculate your housing opportunity goal and then um, figure out what are your transit oriented centers or neighborhood centers that fit into that. And so we just really would welcome the opportunity to speak with your staff and, and help everybody understand where everybody's zoning is in relation to this currently. So please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us or I'm sure um, Dr. Cog's staff can also help you get in touch with us. But this gives a quick overview of Transit Oriented Communities Bill. The goal is really removing the barriers to affordable and attainable housing near transit. Um, and then realizing zoning is a barrier, but not always. And there's a lot of communities with these best practices already in place. And so we want to, with the funding in this bill, help uh, meet those as well. So it should probably impact about 30 jurisdictions, and most of those are in Dr. Cog, where there is this frequent transit enough to try and make sure we're getting a base level of, of zoning and housing density around the transit. So, but the real key here is the bill is based around um, cities and, and counties designating their own um, transit-oriented centers, and, and so there's a lot of flexibility in and choice then and where those should go um, at the local level. Here's the current list and this with all, um, with additional changes, when we tweak things based on a lot of stakeholder feedback we've gotten of like how you define these transit areas, this, could, this list could change, but we wanna kind of be transparent with everyone of like, well this based on the current standards, here's the list as it is right now based on uh, the BRT lines, the rail lines, and the frequent bus lines that have been identified. Um, there's $65 million along with this bill from a TOC infrastructure fund that would help fund uh, infrastructure and affordable housing projects. And then as well, uh, a new housing tax credit for these areas that would be funded at 30 million. In addition, then to also boost affordability, we'd uh, be asking cities to choose at least three strategies from a menu. And then the grant programs would be set up to incentivize going above and beyond on affordability. As I said, the transit oriented centers are really these locally designated areas near the frequent transit service. The neighborhood centers is another level, it's more opt-in. So that'll be open to other uh, communities in the MPO region that maybe don't have the frequent transit now, but would like to build to it. They've got really good downtowns, main streets, mixed use walkable centers where, you know, even if there's not great transit, it's still a good place to put these kind of more multifamily housing types. Um, the overall idea though is to support transit and affordability and that right now there's just not the density needed um, around rail stations and transit corridors to support frequent transit. And that explains at least part of the challenges the transit system has had over the, air, over the years, but obviously not all of it. Um, some quick pictures of what densities look like. This shows what they're doing in other states and regions. And again, I'm just gonna go quick through this stuff, but y'all will get, a, get the packet and we can, we can follow up with any questions you have. Um, so th this gets into then how this works in practice. And what we've done is um, lay out some steps. This is a little bit Getting into the details, I'm going to go to the, this slide. So this is kind of the implementation steps, and this is the next slides after this get into a lot of details that we could walk through with you or your planning staff around, okay, first, how do you determine if you qualify as a transit oriented community? We had that list of jurisdictions up front, but we need to kind of double check that with people, calculating the housing opportunity goal, assessing your existing zoning, uh, what, what in your existing zoning already meets these transit oriented centers, and that's going to be true for a lot of situations because there's a lot of good zoning out there. And then what existing affordability strategies there are. Um, then on the fourth step, you know, determining if the zoning meets the housing opportunity goal, and then if they're sufficient, if not, updating the, the strategies, and then looking at displacement uh, if that's needed as well. And then we've got some more details on like then what are all the timelines on all this and reporting? So that's just kind of a quick high-level overview that I'm trying to keep to a short enough time not to take your whole evening up, but um, wanted to apologize for the words on the page, but also to say we did it so you have all the information. <laughs> um, so I'll skip ahead here because this gets into the details of each one of those steps. 
turn it back over to Um, I also just wanted to, to note, I think one of the biggest departures, I think, from the policy last year is, of course, a lot more um, incentives baked in, but also really taking a step back and making this more oriented towards goals um, versus with all of these other factors, as Nathan mentioned and we've mentioned, zoning being a barrier, but there's also these other barriers like infrastructure um, and honestly frequent and reliable uh, transit service. So I think just going back to to the approach from last year, and I think just really focused on this new approach based on a lot of feedback and stakeholder work. I think we're, we're trying to make it as flexible as possible, but more goal oriented versus I think the bill um, and its prescriptiveness last year. So this is again, um, nothing, none of this is set in stone, but just um, I think for, for people to react to and I think what's currently written into the legislation and we should have an updated draft tomorrow. So we'll make sure to, to circulate that to Dr. Cog uh, staff so, so everybody gets it. But January 31st, 2025, jurisdictions will submit the preliminary assessment of the housing opportunity goals. So if you are a jurisdiction and your housing opportunity goal is already met, you'll receive a early qualification for the incentives laid out in the bill. So that's the sub credit of the state affordable housing tax credit prioritization in transit areas, as well as the TOD infrastructure fund. And then some of the more aligning of our other state resources um, existing funding streams. December 31st, 2026, housing opportunity goals must be met to maintain jurisdiction's share of HUTF. Any withheld HUTF returned when the housing opportunity goal is met. December 31st, 2027, housing opportunity goals become state law. I think just an emphasis on these last two bullet points, because I, I again, nothing is set in stone. This is just the start of the conversation. But I think in order for us to be, we were trying to be responsive to tying goals um, and some of these performance metrics to state funding. And we looked through MMOF, we looked through other funding streams from 260, and HUTF not only just came from some stakeholder feedback, um, but also because it is a meaningful um, pot of funds. And I, I, I did just want to upfront recognize that, you know, we've looked at other states and how they've done this just based on an incentive, just a merely incentive based approach. And um, it's, it's been challenging to have a policy that's just incentive based. And so we're just trying to be responsive to tying it more to state funding, um, but very open to having more conversations around what pot of state funding and then what account uh, other accountability measures um, we could discuss. So I just wanted to upfront say that as, as we talk about these last two slides. And then any withheld HUTF distributions deposited into the TOC infrastructure fund, and then jurisdictions are eligible to receive HUF, HUTF again once they've met um, the housing opportunity goals. So that's again, um, just kind of a rough uh, implementation timeline that's currently drafted into the bill, but as us and the sponsors and all of you in this room and stakeholders have more conversations, I think really one of the one of the things that we'll continue to have discussions around is enforcement and accountability and just making sure that um, you know the incentives are getting to the jurisdictions that are meeting the goals, but we're also um, having some some level of accountability and reporting. I would just say at a high level, like Lani said, we've, we've taken a look at what a lot of other states have done and um, would say, you know, the main goal of the bill is we know we hear a lot, transit is important, housing is important. And I, I think one of the things we, we constantly hear too is that in order to get better housing and transit, you need better transit. And I think the reason that we really focus on this transit-oriented communities bill is you have to look at transit and housing as part of the same conversation and fight, figure out ways to build best transit system and the best housing near transit to support the overall transit system and recognize again, I'll, there are so many communities doing a lot of great work around this, but when a single community is, is building dense near transit, it doesn't matter if the rest of that transit line isn't. And so a lot of this is just trying to make sure that there is regional consistency around development near transit so that we can have a strong high functioning transit system and predictability for the market so that people um, have affordable housing near these transit systems. So just high level, that, that's kind of what we're looking for here. Interested to hear what everyone thinks.
chair being here, we will get started with questions. I would ask, uh, the chair would ask to be as concise as possible so we can get as much in as, as possible. And I'll start with Mr. Flynn just because I saw him first and I'll jot down some names as we go. So, okay. Twice? Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a couple things and no response needed on, the, on this one, but I know that there's some discussion about the authority or the legality of holding HUTF in the first place. So I'm hoping that that's a discussion that continues. Uh, on the uh, TOC bill. On ADUs, uh, I have, I, I would ask that the governor's office and the bill sponsors uh, gather some data on the impact of ADUs in at-risk neighborhoods. Uh, my assessor in Denver gave, gave us some information that parcels that had ADUs added to them sold in Denver, I think it was a two-year study, for a median sales price of $900,000. So while an ADU on my property is good for me, if I can afford it and I can rent it or have my, my mother-in-law live there, et cetera, it's great for me, but in, when I come to sell it, depending if I'm in Brentwood or Marley or Westwood, even where the pilot is, uh, that no one who currently populates that neighborhood would be able to afford it. So over time, it becomes you know, the canary in the coal mine for gentrification. So I'm asking that the bill sponsors at least consider the potential displacement uh, impact of adding a $350,000, dollars $450,000 new investment on the same lot that puts that house and that property out of reach for the long-term uh, multi-generational residents of that neighborhood. Uh, and a, a question then, or maybe two, uh, and Denver just went through a very long year and a half process to design standards in different zoning contexts. I represent suburban context. I have not a single alley in my council district. So an alley house where there is no alley uh, was problematic. So we came up with different setbacks, height requirements, siting requirements for suburban, urban, general urban, et cetera. And it, we had a robust process. Boy, I'm being concise, ain't I? <laughs> so, okay. I <laughs> does, the, does the ADU bill recognize uh, the ability, which 213 did not, one of the many reasons that I opposed it, uh, recognize that uh, cities should have the ability to say, when you're here, an ADU should look like this, whether they're entitled on all lots or not, and it's different in in uh, in Wash Park than it is in um, in Marley or in Harvey Park where there is no alley. Uh, do we still have local control over that sort of thing? Uh, I forgot the other question. In the interest of being concise, I'll stop there. Yes, yeah, so on, on the second piece, I think the main part of the bill is that it's as far as those design restrictions, they can't be any more restrictive than. Um, what exists for the, the primary home. So if, the, if there are different standards for this, the primary residents based on those districts, those same standards can apply to the ADU, um, but not, uh, I guess I would say, not for specific ADU, um, more restrictive standards, if that makes sense. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll read the bill, of course, but in, if a detached ADU is in the back of the lot and the primary structure has a different setback, uh, than the ADU from the back fence where there's no alley, blah, blah, blah. I don't know that we can match that up precisely. Um, my other question was, I think 213 purported to uh, invalidate or override uh, private uh, ownership communities, HOAs, uh, covenants if they said there can only be one residence on a lot. Does this bill do that also? We are still working through some of the language, but the language in the bill does amend Kiowa um, regarding HOAs. We're still figuring out the retroactivity or prospective, um, but we'll get back to you on that. But it does contain that language. And I just wanted to, not to go back to this flow chart, but um, one thing I just wanted to note as you kind of related to the different neighborhoods, local governments could still apply um, design standards in historic district neighborhoods. That's something that, you know, we discussed last year and something that is um, still applicable here. So just wanted to call that out in terms of design and, and aesthetic. Director Odoricio, then Director Spear. 
All right, I'll do my best. I first want to acknowledge that uh, in a time where I feel like local governments across the board are feeling a lack of trust in the past based on some of the stuff coming down from the state, we have three people here that I think are implicitly trustworthy that we've been able to work with. And Nathan, Jonathan, and Elaine have been outstanding haven't had a chance to sit with them, I recommend you do it because I think they're going to be the ones to try to broker some sort of uh, deal here between legislators who I think are consistently pushing the envelope on taking away some of our local government's authority and some of our stuff, uh, some of our responsibilities. Uh, they're the ones who can broker the deal between our concerns and those uh, lofty and actually still well-intentioned goals of the legislature. So I just want to start with that. And, and specifically, I want to highlight the fact that since last year, I see what our input collectively has done in this new, these new proposals. You see incentives and strategies, not just mandates. You see goals based on outcomes, not based on practices. This is a move because we're working with folks like these three, and I just want us to continue to do that, uh, even the moments that we have challenges. The questions I have, of course, are for ADUs to, to for us to make sure that we're also addressing not just the ADU that's a detached building in the backyard, but also within existing footprints, because then there might be situations like uh, like uh, Director Flynn was mentioning, where that might be a compromise where communities that don't want another building in the backyard can still set off and create a mother-in-law suite in the basement or something along those lines. And so that flexibility needs to be built in. I'd like to... Um, uh, really push that the role of the MPO uh, allow us to consolidate some of our efforts. Let's say Adams County and Jefferson County want to work together and we put our density on one side of Sheridan and not the other, but we're working together and we're able to pool some of those outcomes. The third thing I think is important is also we need to be very clear and it takes us all working together on what's the difference between these benchmarks. It's very, we have to be very clear that the HOG that you mentioned, the housing opportunity goals are about potential houses and units versus the one, two, three goals of Prop 1, two, 3, which is actual buildings. And so it's just, I want us to make sure that we are kind of aware as we go through things that we understand that those are different types of benchmarks, but how they can work together. Um, I think the other things that I, obviously, I'm going to just say I'm part of the WTF on the HUTF uh, band. Uh, so I think that finding a different uh, tool or lever is something that I'm going to ask that you do, but I also am going to put it back on these, the folks in this room. We have to, aside from the general premise that I think the state is working from that they always need to have a lever or some sort of control, we still have to recognize that if we don't like that, we have to come up with some incentives to get us to the outcomes. We need to come up with some alternatives or else we're going to be stuck with the stuff that we don't like. So I think that we need to do that. Look at those list of strategies. You know how they said in a few of these? You get to choose on a list of strategies. I believe that this group here will listen to us if we want to add strategies. That'll help us meet the check boxes. And I also think that we, uh, so I'm asking us as a team to identify how we want to work together as an MPO, identify strategies to add to their list of strategies, the menu, and then also um, we got to come up with some alternatives to get us to these outcomes so we're not having a force fed down our throats, which is the WTF on the HUTF. Thank you. I just really, do you mind if I just, Please. thank you, Commissioner, um, for those words. And as, as I said, I think we want to make ourselves accessible, as accessible as possible. On, on just that second piece, um, we are kind of working through that concept of, I don't want to call it fair share, but that, that collaboration and more formalized collaboration of whether or not you're working within the jurisdiction that's next to you or so forth. So we've sent over just some preliminary language. This was just us kind of spitballing um, just to get a reaction of, is this the right direction? And so would love your collaboration. Um, Doug is, and his staff is amazing as always, but um, to kind of get at that component to add it in, um, because we do see that value of, Adams County or whatever jurisdiction wanting to work together to kind of do, to meet the goals together. So we're working through that language in response to the feedback that we've gotten from you guys. Thank you. Uh, Director Spear, then Director Sandgren, then Director Nermella. I believe I saw your hand. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you for being here. The stakeholding feels a lot stronger this year, and I just appreciate that um, we're being included in this way. 
Um, I just had a question uh, around accessibility is my first question. This has come up a lot lately in some of our Dr. Cog meetings, especially as we've seen some of the uh, information on the demographics that are coming with a massive growth in our 65 and older population. Um, and, and so I love seeing that there are accessibility requirements or incentives really for um, the ADUs. Is there anything for TOCs, anything accessibility related, just because what a perfect place to put more accessible, especially affordable housing is um, near these transit hubs? It's a really great question and one that we're actually, I think, trying to be very intentional about and would love your input. Um, we don't have it in this in this deck, but as we kind of think through the housing opportunity goals and the, the list of affordability strategies, I think that there's room there. And it kind of actually corresponds, let me back up for a second, because it kind of corresponds to that first slide of that framework. Part of the value of having that housing needs assessment is not only to look at kind of the demographics, but also to even look down to the to the T of the Alpha and Bravo units, and how much are we? How, how much accessible units have we been producing? What's the unit shortfall by region and by area? And then I think the other part of that, just from a financing standpoint, I know that DOH we've had a lot of conversations around increasing the per unit cap um, and the subsidy that you're receiving from the state. So I think. Just wanted to, to note that we're trying to integrate it into as many of these policies as possible. I think on the housing opportunity goals in terms of the affordability strategies, I think that's an area where we could go even more specific. So definitely open to more feedback and we can share with you um, some of the language from, you know, we have a lot of different strategies as it relates to Prop 123, um, a lot of other affordable housing strategies, but there's one, I can't exactly remember how we wrote it, but I think we could add more around accessibility. Um, so we can send you, you that if you wanna take a look and provide feedback. I think the other thing I just wanted to note, um, when it relates to the CHAPA affordable housing tax credit, which is our state version of the LIHTC, which mirrors um, the LIHTC program, we're boosting that by 30 million to prioritize transit areas. And something that we've thought about is how you can better, I think, prioritize accessibility. They already do that through their qualified allocation plan, but we have this opportunity while also just focusing on these transit areas with that tax credit. So there's room for opportunity there too. Great, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you. Just one, one more relatively quick question, uh, possibly with a longer answer. Um, the other thing that we have been talking about, we just saw some of the preliminary analyses of our um, regional needs assessment, right? I'm sure you saw it too. Um, and we saw that there's going to be a huge need for uh, the lower income housing, right? Zero to 60%, but also zero to 30%. And a lot of our communities are really struggling with homelessness right now. Are there any incentives around kind of the creation of more rapid housing? Because we're dealing with an issue. Um, we, we really needed an extra 500 units like five years ago. <laughs> so just wondering, you know, how, how the, that piece of it's fitting in. Yeah, absolutely. I think, of course, you know, I would say for the TOC bill um, in particular with that CHAFA piece and that tax credit and the affordability strategies, I think what we're trying to thread the needle is trying to look at um, you know, the need across all income levels and really promoting more mixed income versus just developing market rate and trying to make those deals better pencil out. But to your specific question, outside of just some of these efforts, of course, Proposition 123, we're really focused on the 40% that, Do that DOLA has for rapid response through the emergency solutions grants. But I will say on the OEDIT side, in their partnership with CHAFA, we're looking at some of the equity funds and the land banking funds as trying to meet some of those lower thresholds. And then in addition to that, um, through our housing development grant fund, which is revenue that comes in from, not to get in the weeds, but that comes in through our vendor fee, there's still that statutory obligation that one third of those funds go to 30% and below AMI. And so we're trying to look at that it's from 2019, which is crazy because that was a huge battle to get that much money for housing. But um, we're trying to better pair that with the Prop 123 dollars. Um, but of course, all of this is working together. And I think part of going back to the, kind of that framework, if we're looking at all of our needs and our housing needs assessments, how does the state better pair our resources with local resources to address if you're a jurisdiction that does have that need 30% or below, you might have 60 and to 80 percent, um, but better trying to align that all together. Um, but happy to follow up on, on that. 
Uh, Director Sandgren, then Director Nermella, then Director Mul uh, Mulvey. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the carrot versus the stick approach this year. Um, I hope that is what translates from the legislature. Uh, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. The one thing I'm not hearing, though, is um, something that for years we've been waiting to see what kind of changes will come. These are all for rent properties. What's happening in the for purchase world? Is there any movement on the construction defect reform? Um, because while I would love to build more apartments, I think having condos um, would actually help a lot of our seniors more than uh, for rent. Thank you for that question. Of course, you know, we believe that with any of these policies, I think these are all good policies to have in the tool belt, but not necessarily just the panacea. I think similarly with construction defects, I think the governor has been pretty vocal about his support for more home ownership opportunities through insurance reform. I think we're, we're looking at the legislation that's coming forward from uh, Senator Zenzinger and Rachel Kirkmeyer, or sorry, Senator Zenzinger and Senator uh, Kirkmeyer. And so I think he's been very supportive of the concept of trying to reform, um, but I think we're just taking a closer look at the legislation. But I think to your point, the challenge with some of the financing opportunities here too is that they really have been more focused on rental just because of the return. Um, I think outside of just this too, we're really focused, I think with the Prop 123 dollars, we just infuse more money into the modular industry to better promote constructing home ownership units, but we know that the construction defects problem is a real one, and we're, we're hoping to see what happens this session. And the governor stands ready to support um, what, what comes out of it. Thank you. And I will just also echo Commissioner Odoricio on the HUTF, um, the, the reason that we have that fund to help us with maintenance and safety. Uh, we're up in the north area. We have the crash corridor, so we need all those funds to stay up in that north area to address that. So please find another source. Dr. Nermella. Forgot how to use this. Um, I also just wanted to say that this team is, has been great and has reached out to a lot of folks and has um, definitely come up with a strategy that I think will work for a lot of folks. I also would appreciate um, a different option for the HUTF um, funds if that's kind of the holdback on this to find a way, you know, if, if it's somehow through the TIP process. Um, where there's required points or something. So just throwing out <laughs> some, I don't know what, what the option is, but I think overall this is um, healthy for our region. Um, I just had two questions. One is on the, the average density around these TOCs. Um, I know we have some areas that have established, well-established older neighborhoods. We're worried about displacement. Um, and so, but it can, is there some room for flexibility with that, that average density? Because I'm not sure it's necessary if we're, if we have our housing opportunity goal and we find a way through our zoning, um, to meet it and there's just an, it ends up with an alternative density. I would just appreciate that, that there's some and I wouldn't call it a loophole, but some outlet for that to happen, um, especially if we um, potentially provide more affordability in that area. So if we're getting projects that are bringing a higher percentage of affordable units, like that, you know, we're, again, it's focusing on the outcome and not necessarily that one density. Um, and the other... The other question, oh, and I don't know how this relates, but Westminster has a lot of PUD, planned unit development zoning, and I'm not sure how easy or not that would be <laughs> um, to go through and rezone in some of our denser areas. Yeah, on the PUD question, we're looking at some language that would um, verify the local government's and think of it as a PUD is zoning and, a, and not an unchangeable contract. So the, to try and give more enabling authority to local governments to um, and their PUDs. But then also while realizing like a PUD, if it's allowing multifamily development around this transit center, it could still work as the type of zoning that can count towards 
meeting the goal. So there's nothing per se that says a, a PUD is automatically a problem, but if it is, we're trying to work on some language to allow you to solve it easier. Okay, good. Um, and then the other just suggestion I have is as we're locating everybody around transit centers, um, riding transit, unless we somehow get the free ridership, um, is still a, it can be cost prohibitive for those folks that we're mostly trying to get <laughs> into these areas. Um, and so if there's some way to expand the neighborhood scale paths uh, for TOCs at least, um, I know RTD's neighborhood path is more for employer employment areas, but that would be helpful. Moby. Thank you. Again, along the lines of affordability going forward, I'm thinking very from uh, the perspective of a reality that a very large valuation increase and in 40 to 60 in property tax. So I'm also looking at insurability. Insurance premiums are going as well. So how would those factors be considered? Because when you add an ADU, whether it's inside or outside its existing structure or footprint, the taxation and insurability costs will go up and thus make the property much less affordable going forward. And those costs would be transferred to those who rent. Thank you for that question. Um, we actually have some data that we can share um, as it relates to ADUs and the correlation with property tax that we can share. Um, that's a, it's an, it's an interesting question. I, I will say, I think with some of the policy goals here, we don't want that to be passed down to the person that could potentially go into the ADU. I think that's part of why, you know, if you're tapping into these state resources, really prioritizing um, affordability and so that not necessarily local governments can still have deed restrictions and all of these other pieces, but um, making sure that some of these units, if you're getting state resources are not just market rate, but on the property tax, we can follow up more specifically. Director Shaw. Thank you so much. We appreciate the presentation. Uh, my question actually has to do with transit in general, that to make it successful, you have to have both housing and business along the lines. And um, it is very challenging when there are decisions of overlays or use by right or those types of things when you're trying to create a community that actually works for transit, for people, for businesses. So thanks for your comments. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's important in how we've written it that we want to make sure that kind of mixed use development is still something that counts towards the goal. So um, just by having multifamily as administrative approval, in most cases, what you may see is like a more derelict shopping center that's ready to turn over will be the one that maybe can turn over into a more of a mixed use property. And then having more housing in the corridor helps the businesses succeed better. But I, you know, just with how the market works, even with house, housing as an as a administrative approval, you don't see the more successful businesses or successful office spaces um, turn over because they're going to remain given that they're successful, but it provides another option for turnover of, of the less successful areas, I think is the goal we're going for. But thank you for that. It's, it's an important point too. Mr. Wheel. Now I'm gonna recognize myself. Thank you. Um, the uh, Quick question, when do you think we'll have a copy of the presentation and would you be sure to inject information along with that? Absolutely. Uh, we can share out this presentation, and then if you want, <laughs> I can send you all of the eight decks that we've put together. Um, I, <laughs> but, uh, but I can share out at least the most recent ones because they do have a lot level of detail, a lot of um, detail within them. And then we are supposed to get another bill draft back tomorrow. I have a bill draft from 12 to 27, I think, is when that draft is from. Um, but we should get a new revised draft, I think, hopefully tomorrow. 
have an ADU draft that has been circulating from Representative Amable that I can also share out as well. Mr. Chairman, and definitely on the contact information. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, we'll get the presentation out first thing in the morning. And um, yeah, as soon as that new draft's available, we'll, we'll be happy to send that out too. I'm gonna recognize myself for a moment with a, a couple of comments. Thank you for being here, we do appreciate it. Uh, you know, obviously last year was, was a rough, uh, it was rough. I think it was rough for all of us. So uh, we, we certainly appreciate the, the uh, added level of conversation. I know that Dr. Cog's staff is, has very much valued and appreciated your time. We appreciate you being here tonight, so thank you for that. With that said, I've got a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, thank you for affordability actually being part of the, the discussion this year. Uh, last year, it seemed like it was kind of all we do is create inventory, and that will naturally bring down prices. And I think many of us have seen development in our areas and in, in adjoining areas where that it's certainly not, not what happened. Uh, you know, I represent Edgewater, little tiny Edgewater, one, less than one square mile. And we have naturally occurring affordable-ish housing that many of these things really put that at risk. And the one-size-fits-all, which is still here, you know, it may be a little kinder, gentler than, than last year, but there still is some one-size-fits-all. Um, no parking requirements, for instance. Okay, we have 5,000 residents. We have a commercial corridor that runs through our four-block-wide city. And if suddenly we have greater density, what's that do to our businesses? What's that do to the people that live there now? What's that do to us making smart decisions as we try to move along? So I, I do think that the local preemption and saying that the state knows better than local municipalities in terms of making local choices, local decisions, balancing, because these things are a balancing act. Uh, Edgewater does not have a property tax that goes to the city. The property tax goes to fire. So as we increase density, we're going to have to look at what that means. Uh, so I just encourage uh, y'all and, and the bill sponsors to think about the impacts and to think about how, and, and I know all of us believe our community is special, our, our community is different. I, I get that. But there, there is some element of that, that a one-size-fits-all may have disproportionate impact on some communities, like a... a uh, urban-ish community right across the street from Denver that's very small, that any one thing can have great impact on what the character of the, of the city is. Um, carrot and stick. I, I appreciate what Director Sandgren said. I, I do think optically it appears there's more carrot, but as you read the bill, it's more stick. You know, there are still those things that say, oh, you, you have the choice to do this, but if you don't, boom. And so I, I would just encourage us to be genuine with, with what that that situation is. Incentives, absolutely. To me, it's incentive. You do a great job. We're going we're gonna to incentivize that. It's not you do it our way or else, and that's an incentive because I think that's, you know, so we think of, of, of being brought up in, as kids and all that stuff. It's, it's you know, interesting in that regard. Um, and I want to echo, and I'll stop soon. I want to echo what, what Director Flynn said about ADUs. I think ADUs, it's kind of that argument of, oh, if you just increase number of units that will naturally help, but you're absolutely right with what that does to property values. Edgewater, in the time that I've been on council, has gone from 60% ownership, 40% rental, that's flipped. And so as we look at things that create even more landlords and more renters, that has an impact on a community, and that has a, an impact. You know, lots of great words about generational wealth and about a lot of those things, but you could make in, on, on many of those the exact opposite argument if we aren't smart with how we do it. And giving the local communities the ability to help make those smart decisions is, is a part of that working for communities that may be, di may be different and not just telling us how it's got to be done. So, you know, I, I think we, we have made great improvements. I'm still concerned, you know, coming from my community about some of the things that are one size fits all. So I just needed to share that since I had this, this audience and, and had that opportunity. So thank you. Any final questions or comments? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, uh, Judy Kern. Thank you. <laughs> I, I couldn't see your name tag. I apologize. Awesome. <laughs> Director Kern. No worries. I w wanted to bring up something that I, I hadn't seen or heard anybody um, discuss yet. It's more of a safety factor. Uh, we're talking about the ADU component of it. Will there be, not that I'm advocating, please 
do not think this, I'm just wanting to bring it up, uh, more code and <laughs> more regulation. But I am concerned about the safety of people who rent these. If we do not have specific code standards that a homeowner would be able to discuss or a builder could actually go to and say, oh, this is how, this is how you prevent a fire barrier between a basement ADU, or this is how you, when it's in over the garage, this is how fumes, how like carbon monoxide does not get into these ADUs. Is that language in here to help the homeowner and the builders to know what would be safe um, to protect the people who rent these, they don't have to be concerned about doing this. Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. We should always make sure to clarify that all of the, I guess, standards requirements that, that we're talking about are purely around the design aspect. So all base residential building code, fire code, things like that are whole, you know, whatever the, the jurisdiction um, has for those would be followed as, as part of this. So, okay, so then the answer actually is no, there is nothing, because I will tell you that in a lot of cities, particularly mine, there is nothing specific. One, we don't allow ADUs, but two, if we did, there would have to be code changes that would go into place. There is no fire barrier, let's say, specifically if it's an ADU over a garage, uh, to protect the resident that they know that going into this, they would be safe from you know, somebody's car catches fire or there's an electrical thing or whatever. That, and there are standards that would be that need, would need to be added in and met. And I think even the municipalities may not know what they are without some research and some guidance before we just blatantly say, this must go into effect in your communities. And everybody gets excited, starts building these things. And then next thing you know, we have renters who are not safe. I'd like to make sure that we're considering that aspect of it before we move forward, please. Yeah. And, and, I, and again, be happy to, to talk more offline if there are questions. I, again, speaking more from personal experience, most jurisdictions do adopt the whatever base international code, uh, international residential code. Five districts have their fire specific uh, codes that are adopted, that there are ADU specific requirements within each of those codes um, that are required to be followed. So, um, again, it, it will be jurisdiction specific depending on exactly which code you adopt and how that works. But those international codes do have um, ADU protections and, and requirements that, that would be followed. Thank you. Um, I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. <laughs> I, I actually was just going to follow on what everyone else was coming, just so there was one more comment about the concern on property values. In Louisville, we're seeing that with the Marshall Fire rebuild, property values are exorbitant, uh, much higher than anybody, I think, anticipated because the build cost being so high. And when we go ahead and say, now it's not just going to be somebody finishing a basement and renting it out, but we're going to add additional dwelling space. These property, we're, we're talking property values two years ago that were at a million, that'll probably be pushing two. And that does not mean for affordability for people. So I, I agree and would love to see that addressed. Thank you for bringing that up. I was just gonna note on the, the I know John addressed most of your question, but the other piece to, I think the bill is also offering some technical assistance so that local governments who get some of the funding and also offer, um, I think tapping into those incentives can also have some home ownership education around kind of the health, health safety and welfare. Um, so definitely want to continue talking about just re just from a resource standpoint of spreading awareness of, of I think some of these components too. So just want to call. And for one final comment or question, if somebody has one, otherwise, thank you very much for being here. We really do appreciate it. it that, we will move ahead to the report of the chair. Uh, we will start with report of the Performance and Engagement Committee. Uh, Mr. Baker, sorry, I no just kind of left no my problem. body for a moment there. The uh, Performance and Engagement Committee met this evening. We had two items to consider. One was location and um, details about our um, board retreat. And so you can expect to maybe a poll or a survey come out asking about dates for that. We have set the date. This was the second item, was the 2024 awards celebration. You can put it on your calendars. It will be August 28th, Wednesday, August 28th. It will be back at the Sewell Ballroom. And uh, uh, look for more information to come uh, about that here in the near. That's my remote report, Mr. Chair. Hey, there was no finance and budget committee meeting, so I assume you have that report. You're welcome to do a report. I'm, I'm good, thank you. Okay. <laughs> and now, report of Doug Rex, executive director. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Four items for you this evening. The first, um, you may have noticed a change in the board agenda format over the last couple months. Um, this is a direct response to Senate, or sorry, House Bill 21. 1110, which uh, strengthens state law regarding accessibility standards for persons with disabilities related to government information technology systems. And rules are, are currently being promulgated on, the, on that law, but, uh, and, and, and the law goes into effect July 1st. So which is kind of a dress rehearsal for us. We're, we're working through the kinks of this, but uh, I want to thank Ashley Summers and our communications team um, for their uh, patience as we as we get through this, and and Melinda too. She's, I cringe every time she sends me a version of the of the agenda that I got to make a change because I know it, it, there's a lot goes into actually making that change. So, so uh, thank you all very much on that. Um, committee solicitations for for uh, for board members. Um, I just want to point out that. Uh, the following all close this Friday with regards to solicitation. So we're, we're looking for, to fill various seats and committees um, throughout the region as well as our very own. So first and foremost, our performance and engagement committee and finance and budget committee, which are subcommittees of the board. Um, please, if you're interested in serving on those, we would love to have you. So please get your, um, um, please just contact uh, Melinda with which committee you're interested. And if you don't have a preference, that's good too. We can we'll stick you on one. So so please let us know. We know that there are probably half or so that are required to have a a, a permanent seat on on one of one of the other committees. So we, I know Melinda's already reached out to most of you. Um, so the regional committees that we have open solicitations out for the first is the State Transportation Advisory Committee, um, uh, and the E470 Board. Uh, the, and also our advisory committee on aging, which is kind of Dr. Cog's AAA um, policy committee. If you're interested in serving on that, we would love to have you. The more board members we can have, the better. So please be uh, interested in that. And last but not least, the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. We uh, Two seats are up for that. And uh, that, uh, that solicitation also closes on Friday. So if you're interested in any of those, please reach out to either Melinda or I, and we'll make sure you get on the list for consideration. Um, oh, I also want to point out in the packet this evening, in the informational item section, which is there for your information, there are three very important uh, items in there, all of which there will be action on next month. The, the first is our federal policy statement. You'll notice that this document is it's streamlined than from past years. It's, it's less than half the size of what it previously was. Um, it was on the advice of our, uh, our new federal lobbyists. They looked at it and said, oh, my God, it's a lot. And there's a lot of redundancy in there, and we, you know, we fully admit that. So we, we streamlined it to the, to the extent that we felt comfortable doing so, and, and, um, and our federal lobbyists seem to be happy with it, too. But please, please have a look at that. Um, we did not provide a red line because you would no way you would ever be able to read it. So we're providing you a clean copy. It's like 14, 16 pages of text. Um, we also uh, provided to you the 2023, our current version as well, so you can compare. Um, yeah, so the other two, so the, also the nominating committee recommendation for the 2024 board officers is included in your packet. That will be voted on next month. And last but not least, the draft comprehensive economic development strategy or the SEDS document, it's, uh, it's in there for, for your review as well. We'll be voting on that next month as well. And last but not least, uh, I just want to make a plug for our Winter Bike to Work Day, February uh, 9th, fr uh, Friday. And this is a winter event geared towards demonstrating that bike bicycling is a, a viable option year-round. I don't know how many were on bikes this past weekend. Will there be but, negative temperatures yeah. then? Do we know? <laughs> we promised the Chamber of Commerce Day on February 9th. Um, there's a dozen stations around the region. And if you have any questions, please just reach out to myself or Steve Erickson on our staff or, or visit our um, biketoworkday.com uh, website for additional information. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We'll move ahead to item number eight, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. If there's additional requests from the public to address the board, time can be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board. Consent and action items will begin immediately following after the last speaker. Do we have any public comments? 
We have no one online, no one in person for public comment, so we will move ahead to the aforementioned consent agenda, which is a summary of the December 20th, 2023 meeting, also uh, designating the location for posting notices of meetings. Do we have a motion on the consent agenda? Mayor Starker. Thank you. And seconded by Mr. Husband. So thank you very much, Director. Uh, any discussion? All in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay. And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Moving ahead, it is now time for Rich Morrow, Director of Legislative Affairs, who will kick us off. Oh, I skipped. Well, there I go. Sorry about that, Rich. Sorry about that, everybody. Uh, just trying to move us ahead. Uh, item number 10, discussion of Dr. Cog's Climate Pollution Reduc Re Reduction Grant, Priority Climate Action Plan Update and Implementation Grant Proposal, uh, which is Attachment D in your packet. And we have Robert Spots, Manager of Transportation Planning and Operations. Sorry, I almost skipped over you. No, no offense taken. <laughs> Director Barr said, it's only the air. Good evening. Uh, it's been a while since we've talked to you about this subject, um, but there's been a lot that's happened in the uh, interim. So, um, help me. Oh, there we go, we're good. Okay, just a refresher. So this is uh, a $5 billion program funded through the Inflation Reduction Act uh, nationally, administered by EPA. And so the first tranche of funds of $250 million was for planning. Uh, and so $1 million went to about the largest 70 metropolitan statistical areas and $3 million to each state that were willing to accept it. So um, that's the first part of this program. Uh, and then that's leading to this next um, exciting phase we're about to enter, which is $4.6 billion nationally in implementation to put these plans into action. It's an incredibly short timeline. Um, on April 19th of last year, the Dr. Cog board voted unanimously for Dr. Cog to be the planning agency for this grant effort. Uh, we were not awarded that grant until August 1st. So really August 1st is the time when this effort kicked off. So it's been a short four months to get where we are and you'll see the amazing amount of work that we've got done in part by Maddie Nasbet here who was hired under this grant and has been working so hard to get us to where we are today. We also hired the consultants Lotus Sustainability to help us out and they have been invaluable in getting us to this point. Um, this, the, the grant was designated for the Metropolitan Statistical Area. So it's a little different than the Dr. Cog region itself. Uh, so we were ob obligated to do this planning work for the pink area in this map, but uh, working with our partners in Boulder and Southwest Weld County who w eagerly wanted to participate, we uh, were allowed by EPA to incorporate them. So this planning geography is just a little bit larger than our um, typical planning geography, including Park and Elbert counties. Um, so the, the planning grant has three main deliverables here, and we're, we're here, uh, to, we can, we're going to talk about the other ones at a later date, but today we've gotten this far on the Priority Climate Action Plan, which is due on March 1st. Um, we're giving you an introduction so that you can consider taking action and adopting this plan in February next month. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Maddie to describe our Priority Climate Action Plan, where we're at. Hi everyone, excited to be here today. So as Robert mentioned, I'm gonna to talk to you about the Priority Climate Action Plan that is due in 10 weeks, um, a little less actually than that. So the purpose of Dr. Cog's Priority Climate Action Plan, the main things that we really wanted to have intertwined throughout the document is it to be really clear that these are voluntary strategies. No one is, these are not required. You are not, you have to do this. Um, we, we would love if you did, um, but yeah, voluntary strategies. Um, it's also an opportunity to reduce greenhouse gases, but also co-pollutants, such as ozone precursors. Um, the big thing that we'll talk a lot about, anytime you hear us talk about this, this big opportunity, is discussing uh, economic disparities, specifically for low-income, disadvantaged community populations. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so, yeah, we, and it was really encouraging earlier hearing people also talk about this. So, you'll see that throughout. Um, but, yeah, really addressing those, those specific communities for this, um, and also talking about the Justice 40 um, initiative through the administration. Um, also want to note something that's really exciting. Um, there's eight strategies total, total in our PCAP. Um, they can be customized. I know someone said earlier, which made me chuckle, but I actually do believe that every community is really unique and something that's exciting um, and intentional about this is that you can customize this um, for your community's specific needs. 
And finally, and finally um, just defining local and regional initiatives that collectively impact the entire Denver region. I'm really excited. Um, a big thing about this is a regional approach, which has been, we've had so much encouragement, so much engagement, which I'll touch on. Um, I've just never seen personally anything like this of how excited people are to, to talk about this from all, from all realms. So there's a handful of elements required from the EPA and then a few that we decided to just include because that's what we thought was right. Um, so when you look at the Priority Climate Action Plan, um, we have a public and stakeholder engagement section. We have a greenhouse gas inventory and then that low income disadvantaged communities benefits analysis. So what that means is we're doing all these great things, but what does that actually look like for those communities? Um, so I'll touch on that. And then specifically those eight measures, which are those greenhouse gas reduction strategies. And we'll quantify those. We have the review of authority to implement. So once again, we have all these great strategies, but who takes the reins? What, what could that look like? Um, and we talk about that as well as the workforce planning analysis. This actually was not required for the PCAP, but something we felt really passionate about. Um, we wanna bring jobs to Colorado. We wanna boost our economy. Um, so we actually went ahead and did incorporate this. So this is personally the slide I'm most excited to talk to you all about today. Um, when we looked at the EPA guidelines, they're pretty broad, honestly. They're kind of a um, choose your own adventure in some ways. And with that though, public and stakeholder engagement, we really went above and beyond for this given the tight timeline. Um, when I'm on calls with, with the EPA, um, some other MSAs are doing two meetings. So we've done <laughs> quite a bit more than that. So starting from the top here, um, we've done monthly stakeholder steering committee meetings. So with some of your colleagues, um, really great turnout for this. A minimum of 40 people, upwards of 60 people every month take time out of their busy schedule to, to give us feedback, information, what they want their community to have. Um, and also a phenomenal project management team. And that's composed of half a dozen experts from throughout the region um, in varying environmental fields. So they've also been helping us guide this project. We, we chose to do this. Um, we wanted to form an equity subcommittee. Again, this was not required of us, but something we felt extremely important for throughout this pro uh, process. Um, and that's a composed of about half a dozen individuals from various community-based organizations. And they've been throughout this um, part of our implementation workshop, really um, working with us closely to make sure that equity is at the forefront of this plan. Um, we also had two virtual public meetings. The first one, as I'm sure you can, you can understand, it's a really complicated process. There's a lot of moving parts. There's no grant that's ever been like this exactly. So um, that first one was just to inform the general public about, hey, this is what the next four years could look like, um, especially this first part, which is at rapid speed. Um, and the second one was again, to really um, dig our heels in and hear feedback, uh, critiques, information, again, what uh, community members want for their neighborhoods um, and to incorporate that into the actual plan itself. But there's more. Um, we also wanted to have another channel, which was our public engagement website. It's called Social Pinpoint. You might be familiar with it, but essentially what it is, is there's a bunch of questions and answers. We, I am the one answering them in real time. So we wanted to give people plenty of opportunity, ample opportunity, although the tight timeline, to really hear their voices. Um, and people really did turn out for this, which has been wonderful. So again, giving people multiple channels. So if you missed one meeting, that's not the be all end all. These are recorded, we have a website, we have engagement in, in all different areas, and that was really important to us. Um, again, a big question we got a lot was coordinating with the state, um, who's also creating a um, priority climate action plan. That's through the uh, Colorado Energy Office, and we have been working with them very closely. It's been a really wonderful experience. And finally, um, super excited about this, was just the dozens and dozens of meetings I've been able to have the pleasure um, to work with nonprofit groups and other individual stakeholders and just people from the community who have been so engaged about this. It's been really, it's been really special. So that was another thing that um, was really great about this. So Lotus Engineering and Sustainability was our consultant. They are really great. They've been nothing but phenomenal for this and we could not do it without them. They completed the greenhouse gas inventory for us. Um, again, we'll, we can dive more in detail next month when we um, talk more about the PCAP in depth, but just a quick um, touch on this. As you'll see, over 50% of the emissions are in the building sector and 34% from transportation. 
Right. So how do we get to these eight strategies? It's definitely been a process here. So like I mentioned at the start, there's obviously requirements and bumpers from the EPA that we have to follow. Um, one of those being that in order for a measure to be in a PCAP, it must fit in one of the six sectors. So that is electric power, transportation, industry, and so forth. If it is not in one of those, it, is, it cannot be in the plan. Um, then we obviously had the completion of the inventory, which, which gave us feedback for the measures, worked with the community members as we discussed, um, and again, hosted those public meetings, had that engagement platform, presented at community events, and spoke with anyone who wanted to, to hear us out. So um, we have eight strategies total, like I mentioned. Um, I can do kind of a high level here, but essentially what you're looking at is there's three buckets that from the feedback we receive from the public, from our stakeholders, from our project management team, um, we have buildings, um, transportation, and then workforce development. So those are the three that we're looking at. Um, again, we have a comprehensive climate action plan that is due in 2025, and that will incorporate all sectors. Um, we'll have quantification for all measures in all sectors. So. Um, if you see something up here that you're wondering maybe why agriculture isn't here, that will be in the Comprehensive Climate Action Plan. Um, it's just not feasible to have every single sector in the PCAP. So again, as we mentioned, this is moving at a rapid speed. Um, January 11th, we had a workshop that had about 60 people turn out. It was um, super helpful, and we're currently incorporating that feedback into the, uh, into the PCAP draft. That PCAP draft is due this Monday um, to our editor here at Dr. Cog. And then next month, you all will hear from us again um, to discuss more and take action on this Priority Climate Action Plan. And with that, I will hand it off to Robert. Thank you. So now, now we're on to this, uh, this next $4.6 billion part of for the um, so the notice of funding opportunity was released in September. Um, so a lot to digest by then and kind of gather the best strategy to get the money here as well as the best focused area. So these grants can be anywhere from $2 million to $500 million. So I think we have a lot of um, ambitious folks here that really want to bring as much money as possible, the money and have as big of an impact here as possible. Uh, in only two weeks from now, we're going to submit a letter of intent to apply if we move forward and applications are due on and it is a big application. It's 25 plus pages plus appendices, a lot of work to do. Um, the way that we've been interpreting the, the notice of funding uh, opportunity is that EPA, we feel like, is they really want to encourage innovation and large partnerships. Um, they, they are emphasizing that they are going to spread this money around the, the entire country. You know, I don't think this is all going to certain areas. Um, so, you know, the, obviously they're, they're evaluating the impact of the greenhouse gas emission reductions from the versus the cost as well. Um, this is part of the administration's Justice 40 requirements. So, 40% of the benefits of these funds have to go to low and in, benefit low co low income and disadvantaged communities. So they're evaluating how how the program or process will take it will will take that into consideration, and just the overall approach of this the project. How can this be scaled nationally and have you know a transformative effect um, in reducing our so, um, with advice from our stakeholders, our project management team, we discussed, and we, we really did believe and recommended um, and got really good consensus that we should really just focus on one big regional effort. It shouldn't be, you know, piecemeal, you know, dozens of agencies submitting their own smaller grants. Why, why do that and each submit a 25-page grant on top of everything else when we could all focus together and re really pull um, our regional weight together and transcend these um, jurisdictional boundaries we have between us? So we kind of solicited from um, our stakeholders if they had a concept that they wanted us to champion, what would it be? And so we had two um, groups come forward. The Energy Office proposed something, a statewide local climate action accelerator, um, which was really about a, a kind of a program where there'd be um, – assistance for uh, developing policy changes at local governments. And by doing that, you would unlock funds to implement them. Uh, the second one is a program called Decarbonize Dr. Cog. Um, it was presented by the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network. Um, and I'll talk more about that because that, that was the program that our stakeholders really got behind. Um, we, we did vote, uh, have a, a little poll or a vote, and. You can see, uh, even though that supported both, so it was like 92% of the folks really uh, supported this decarbonized Dr. Cog program. Um, we, given the majority, we're supporting just the decarbonized Dr. Cog program, and our recommendation to really focus on one big, big regional grant rather than spread out our resources 
we, we have opted to just pursue this decarbonized Dr. Cog program, which I will explain now. So this has been developed by the Front Range Beneficial Electrification Network. This is a group that's been meeting for about a year and change um, as part of Excel Energy's Partners in Energy program. It's got members of this group from over 25 uh, of our local governments, as well as a couple outside of our area. And uh, they're always looking for more folks to support them. But their goal is to build a comprehensive regional program that provides services to interested households and businesses to accelerate energy efficiency improvements and the electrification of buildings. So from our inventory, it's 50% of our greenhouse gas emissions, and it's just a really tough sector to tackle because there's a lot of really expensive infrastructure um, and a lot of individual touch points, right? There's millions of buildings in this region, and each one of them um, has its a different type of infrastructure and unique challenges with it. So in order to address that, um, I mean, these, these folks are so smart and so passionate about this, and they've been such great partners. You know, they, they've, they've really looked at this market kind of holistically and comprehensively. Um, now, the, 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 the program, I'm going to read my script here. I don't normally do this, but it's, it's important enough that I'm going to not mess, mess up my words. Um, so uh, the grant proposal is going to target equitable and coordinated building energy efficiency and decarbonization through seven connected programs that aim to stand up a comprehensive regional program with the potential to transform the local market. So those first three in yellow, they're programs that aim to ease the cost and administrative burden of improving a building's energy efficiency and decarbonizing the building while reducing, so, uh, while reducing climate pollution. First, the full service decarbonization program for low income and disadvantaged communities is basically a program where someone would walk, knock on your door and basically walk you through and pay for the vast majority of that, the home um, change with as little, as little administration and cost hassle as possible. The energy improvement advisor would uh, subsidize trained advisors to guide home and building owners through a full suite of decarbonization opportunities. So it's a one-stop shop right now to navigate this process. I've been through it myself and I haven't been successful because it's a really challenging program and contractors will talk you out of, out of, out of these systems because they don't understand them, right? Um, and so the final is in, incentive, incentives and rebates to, make, to ease the cost burden of, of transition so that when you were considering perhaps replacing your furnace, at least as um, affordable, if not more, to go with a heat pump or um, all electric system. The, the net, those are great, but they're not going to work without a supportive system underneath them. So we do not have the workforce right now, um, in, in HVAC folks, plumbers, electricians, to support the work that needs to be done for these millions of homes. So the workforce development program will bring new entrants into building decarbonization trades and professions, and as well as upscale uh, current workforce with scholarships for industry provided courses on the job training and certification, and it will supply supportive services like childcare and transportation to offset wages lost uh, during training. Policy accelerator program through cross-jurisdictional collaboration could drive more consistent and ambitious building codes and update the electrification permitting process, which is a real barrier and a real challenge right now. So collectively working together to get these barriers taken down to enable this change. And finally, um, is the, an innovation fund. So this is a market transfer transformation initiative di designed to jumpstart new ideas in building decarbonization. So the fund will support testing cutting edge solutions to market barriers, impeded the adoption of heat pump uh, space and water heating. This would, you know, this would allow private folks to really have an opportunity to, to um, improve these processes and make innovative changes. And finally, this, this all stands on, the, on the, the foundation of really good community engagement, program co-creation, and education. So the program as it's, it's, as it's proposed right now, there's a lot of work that has to be done right now. Um, we're thinking both in terms of the scale this project needs to be in, in order to be effective and have that transformative quality, as well as what is the best strategy to get the money here through this competitive process and the EPA. So you can see that these, kind of these, these buckets have different ranges. And we're kind of evaluating all of that in the context of the of, um, options. So we, we, we'll, we'll flesh out these concepts more as we're thinking about the grant application. Um, but as, as, as the regional agency here leading this plan, we've been asked by our stakeholders to take this role on and submit the regional application. I don't know if I need to read all of these off, but I think the, one of the big things is, you know, 
every single local jurisdiction could administer one of these programs, but that doesn't really match the scale of the problem or the, the markets that are, that are here in this region. Contractors don't really notice often when they cross jurisdiction boundaries. Um, the marketing and, and the supply chain issues, contractors, they're all regional, right? And if we can have a central administrating um, agency that really takes the burden off administration. Um, so with that, you know, we, because we've been asked to do that, we came to you as soon as we could. Um, you know, this happened on January 2nd. Basically, basically um, to get your approval on moving forward with this grant application, being successful, and then administrating this program um, to benefit all of our res residents in this region. With that, I'm happy to take any questions, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Yes, thank you. I just um, <clears throat> I want to recognize all the work that went into this. It's a really fast timeline, and and I think it's and government moves at a glacial pace, but this sort of set a different tone for us. So that's an inspiration. I appreciate that. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Uh, like the workforce goal, the 1250 to 1500 um, new contractors, how does this positively impact the need? We know there's a dearth and, and what's coming down that pipeline for employment. Um, so can you share a little bit about like, does this have a major impact or is this moving us uh, slowly forward? So the, the, the need for the contractors or? The total uh, over five years of 1,500 new contractors coming in, like, is this on pace with what we need for this, um, this Got it. Sorry. Um, so I think probably not. Uh, I, th I think, you know, we, we theoretically like to have all $4.6 billion here to make this transformation. I think we're just uh, a little bit constrained in terms of the resources, and so we're, that's why we're thinking about this range. Um, I know that the Furbin Group has done a full workforce analysis, and they have modeled out to 2030 and 2050. I could get back with you with those specific numbers, but they do they do actually have hard numbers for what they expect the need in this region. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, and just trying to understand the pool for the um, implementation grant, did you have to be uh, granted the planning grant to be eligible? Sorry, that's a, that's a really important point. No. Um, so we, I don't think we mentioned that for a grant to be eligible, it does have to match the strategies in your priority climate action plan. However, any local government that is under the umbrella of a planning area, so any of you, for example, would be eligible to apply for a grant. Again, we thought the best strategy was to collaborate and make it for this region. Great. And then my final point is just to comment, you know, I'm fully supportive of this. I think it's bold and collaborative, and this is the sort of approach that we need to be taking across the region. I'm impressed with what those 25-plus agencies were able to come together with these eight strategies, um, and really excited for that conversation to continue. Hold. Thank you. Thank you very much. Three in the queue, uh, Director Flynn, Director Williams, and Director Levy. Director Flynn. Thank you. Just a quick clarification. During the uh, Denver's internal team prep meeting, yesterday on the pie chart uh, that was in the the uh, deep, uh, face CPAP uh, app <laughs> <laughs> we might need a CPAP if we don't do this <laughs> yeah. uh, we were under the impression that fugitive emissions might have included methane emitting from the landfill but you also have a solid waste category of one percent what is the what is the solid waste category is that landfill and it's it's not included in fugitive emissions, or can you explain that? Fugitive emissions sounds so sinister, you know. <laughs> okay, so. okay. Um, yeah. So from sorry. So Lotus did make this inventory. So please follow up with us. We need to connect you with them if you have if anyone has questions. So yeah, my understanding from them is that yes, that is separated. So landfill is separate from fugitive emissions. Okay, and fugitive emissions would be like oil field. Refinery yeah, burn like off. refrigerants leaking, things like that. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. That's all. Inspector Williams. Thank you. Just wanted to probably echo Director Scheherazade's uh, compliments on this. I think this is a great 
product that the stakeholder group uh, came up with. Um, you know, and again, attacking, I'm glad the pie chart is still up there, really attacking kind of the biggest cause of greenhouse gas emissions. You talked about co uh, coal benefits, ozone. Of course, we're still under uh, ozone non-attainment um, uh, on this. And really, you know, the decarbonization of building is something Denver's really trying to um, uh, uh, really address. And, and, and this is great. We've got home, industry, local government, everyone uh, gets a chance non-mandatory uh, on this, and I think probably the best thing, and, and my local government friends will probably agree, no match uh, on this. So just really wanted to compliment the group that put this together. Uh, very excited to see this work. Thank you. Three in the queue. We've got Director Levy next, uh, Director Kondo, and Director Nermella. Great. Levy. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, you know, Boulder County had a very large role in developing this proposal, so obviously I'm very supportive of it. Uh, my question is around that range of from 43 million to 155 million that uh, that we might go for, and I'm just wondering how you, um, as the grant writers and your partners, are going to um, game out, you know, what what to ask uh, actually ask for because it's a huge range. And then I have another question. Uh, thank you. It's a good question, and um, to be. We might go even higher. We might go lower. I, we, I think the main thing is there are – the way this grant is structured, the NOFO is structured, is that there's funding tiers. And so when you apply within a funding tier, you're actually not competing against the entire field of applicants. You're only competing against folks within your own – so there's a, one, of the, one of the tiers – sorry, not fields. Tiers is 100 to $200 million. So if you submit a grant in that tier, you may be competing against – 100 folks for five grants, and we're not going to know the answer, and we're just doing a bunch of game theory, frankly, here to figure out what we think we're the most likely to get the funding in and strategic. So we might, we might be more likely to get funding at a $50 million tier, but then the program might not be effective. And so we're kind of debating between a more likelihood of funding versus going for the big swing and getting that home run. Sorry, nope. that's not a better answer. We're, that's not an answer. That's not an answer. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, that's the best you can do. However, you are going to have to put a number in there, and I, I am just wondering about your thought process. You have to decide by February 1st, so it's going to happen very soon. Okay. I think okay. we're, in fact, I think we're helpful. having a meeting tomorrow morning. Yeah. Okay. So the, the other question I have, of course, I, you know, again, I do very strongly support this proposal, but the, the proposal from the Energy Office, what um, did that hit another aspect of greenhouse gas reductions, or what was that proposal just – for the sake of full knowledge? Yeah, so I think um, it probably, uh, uh, it wasn't as fleshed out as the, this front, this decarbonized Dr. Cog proposal. It, I think after they gave their presentation, several people were left thinking it was the best presentation they've seen in a very long time. And it's just, been, it's so thoughtful and comprehensive and they have so much supportive structure, both in terms of writing this grant, but also just the way they've thought through this industry comprehensively and all the ways this needs to be tackled. Energy Office's program was um, really, really high level still. And I think there was some concern that even with a, if, even if they got funded with a $100 million grant, $200 million grant, once you divide that up between 300 communities statewide, how much money is there to incentivize changes to policy? Um, so with a community tackle land use or something like that for an $8 million grant or a $5 million grant? And I think the answer was probably no. And I think, I think a lot of our folks that really do want to see policy change also recognize that the carrot of a grant wasn't really like the barrier so much. It was, there's, just a, there's a lot more barriers in getting good policy um, than just having a single one-time carrot. So, so I, think, I think there's a lot of support for the Furban proposal because of that. Right. Okay. Thank you. And the, just on that range of budget, possible budget components of it, I would really urge you maybe to just look line by line on that. And I think others have already said this, but the um, the energy advisors, I, those are going to be really, really important to getting this into the low income and disadvantaged communities. Uh, so go big on that, and and I would say go big on the rebates and incentives workforce. Really, I I think those those three elements are going to be really important to success. Thanks very much. Uh, we have Director Kondo, Director Nermella, and Director Barr. Direct and uh, Director Spear following that. Director Kondo. 
<clears throat> Thank you. So fundamentally, I think this is a great idea. Uh, I have two thoughts. And first of all, regarding heat pumps, once you get below 40 degrees, the efficiency of heat pumps drops and your energy consumption goes up. And in light of the recent cold freeze that we experienced, that, that might create some discomfort for people if their heat pump stops working. So I, I'm just, I hate, I'm not trying to be a wet towel, but I am trying to be realistic in terms of physics. Uh, so I want to make sure that we acknowledge that, that we have to write uh, environmental climb zone for heat to be a viable option, which then leads me to my second thought that, you know, I wonder if you're going to get the biggest bang for the buck instead of transforming individual houses from furnace to heat pumps to trying to develop policy to get large apartment complexes, uh, multiple units and high density to transition to heat pump. And in that particular arrangement, maybe you could have a hybrid sort of setting so that you do have gas heating just in case you do get into a cold freeze, just like we just experienced. So that part of that, you know, if your heat pump is not working, you still have an alternative heat source uh, for people to stay warm. So I, I just wanted to offer those two thoughts. Hey. Director Nermella. Uh, props for getting this much done <laughs> for like in no time. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, I, when I talk to Excel, uh, I'm glad they're a partner in this, but um, they, they say that they're not prepared for electrification throughout the state in terms of the capacity. I mean, Westminster, we've definitely been impacted by that, um, by just their existing capacity in areas. So um, that would just be a caveat. And with that caveat, uh, I would hope that we're working with Excel and um, you know, the PUC for just more flexibility in energy development and having um, more options available for communities to be able to provide that and, and you know, fill the gap um, for this energy production that we're gonna need. Um, so there's that. One question, uh, question I have for the, the, re, um, for the incentives and rebates, I don't know if it still exists, but we had a PACE program, which, which basically was a financing tool for buildings to make energy improvements and then it actually was kind of through property taxes. I don't know if that's something that this program could potentially work with on the, these efforts, but it's, they seem very aligned. Um, I don't know if you... Um, so I think there, there's, there's actually several kind of existing um, programs that could augment this. I think we can build this program around programs like that, that they could kind of double the impact and the incentive to, to make this transition. So we'll, we'll be shaking all the trees and finding all the incentives and rebates we can. Yeah. Okay, and then one last thought was that um, for the innovation fund and just encouraging private businesses, we already have a pretty strong partnership with the Smart Cities Alliance. Um, so, and they, those are already private entities working on problems. So, at, at, at trying to do at multiple community scale. So, hopefully, that's something that can somehow be tapped into. Director Barr, then Director Spear. Um, I'm going to face that way and refer to you. So, um, uh, I just want to compliment you on all the work that you've put into this. Um, it's a huge program, and I think as we, uh, at least in my experience working through other EPA Justice 40 programs that are equivalently sized, the biggest, some of the biggest hangups in the implementation are the workforce. Um, and I'd say, you know, the effects of doing a lot of these large-scale water, wastewater, other infrastructure programs. The limiting reagent hasn't been the technology. It hasn't been the, the local will. It has actually been just a physical number of people to do the work. And I think, you know, in the way that your conceptual budget is currently laid out, it kind of gives equal weight to all these categories. And I would say incentives, um, advisement, um, even to the degree of marketing, engagement, and policy, all these things can truly be focused on that contractor realm. Um, contractors tend to be the first ones that uh, a homeowner will call. Um, even municipalities tend to have a reliable bench of contractors. 
And honestly, none of this gets implemented without them, without the people physically wiring, ducting, and doing the work. And so I would say if you were to make any change at all to this conceptual budget, to swing hard on the workforce development, and you could even ease up on other aspects of it. But again, much appreciated in the work. And I'll look at you now. <laughs> <laughs> Director Spear, then Director Mulvey. Thank you. I'm just going to pile on some kudos here. Um, some of the things that I really like about this, one is that it's really hitting a lot of the different barriers to decarbonizing buildings. So um, going from navigational services to building workforce to um, providing some turnkey solutions for people in affordable housing. So um, kudos for that. And then the other thing that I really like about it is that it's really addressing this issue in a regional way. So whether a, a particular municipality has um, large capacity for taking on some of the work or less capacity, it doesn't really matter. Everybody gets to benefit from these programs and services across the whole region. So just really thoughtful and I think is reflective of the um, thorough engagement process that that you all did, so thank you. Director Movi, then Director Peck. We'll try to close out with Director Peck and ask for a motion after. Um, I have input and comments. I need the comments um, from, that we've heard. I'm, I'm particularly pleased to see work that meant factors because I think what may not be emphasized is that if you want to convert somebody home heating source, you're asking them to do a big and expensive job. And then the other element of it has to do with maintenance. So I wonder if as a matter of input, you might also consider not just conversion, but helping people with maintenance. People who currently have heat pumps and the like, but also home warranty systems and such. Not everybody has access to those things. Director Peck, and then we'll close out with Director Kern. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. It's really interesting. Um, per the workforce part, we've run into that in a lot of cases that um, the contractors or subcontractors do not have any idea on how to implement any of these things. I was wondering if you had any input or any desire to work with uh, community colleges to uh, to perhaps support a portion of tuition or incentives for people, especially the lower socioeconomic part of our society, to go to school to get this training. Not every uh, community college has a manufacturing plant, or but to the ones that do have that. Um, I was wondering if you are working with them. Yeah, thank you. That's a really wonderful question. And I'm very excited to say that, yes, that is something we are actively um, working with. We want to do high school. Um, but part of it is the education aspect of letting people know that um, this is a viable career um, and tied back to that good jobs initiative, which is, I'm sure you're familiar, but if not, um, high paying, long term, see a career, stable jobs. So, yes, definitely looking at that pipeline for, for accessing those schools. Hey, Director Kern. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you from the entire city of Louisville for doing this. Um, we've worked really hard locally to try and implement some great things. Fuller County is phenomenal on this topic, and it is so incredible to see the entire Front Range area in the Dr. Cog program. We're all very excited. I got a letter from my sustainability manager in the city who was just like, please say thank you to everyone in that room. So. Uh, thank you. <laughs> but so post martial fire, one of the things that we've learned is what all of you have talked about. Um, air source heat pumps have been complicated at a minimum. Um, the, and I would agree um, with Director Peck. The big thing is education, education, education. I would say 1% of contractors know how to do anything that is energy efficient, that supports sustainability. And it is not for dislike of the technology. It is lack of knowledge. It is lack of access to that knowledge. We are very fortunate in Louisville, Boulder County, and having resources to draw on, but I don't think that's that most people do. And it, it, an advisor is great, 
But if contractors don't know what you're talking about, homeowners do not have and should not be required to have the bandwidth to know every detail of how to make their homes more efficient. It will be impossible, um, let alone facing that. I, I also, so we're talking about heat pumps, air source specific heat pumps. Cold climate is a thing for us. It's not like we don't have cold climate. Why are we selling non-cold climate heat pumps still? <laughs> just, just to point the fact, uh, Louisville experienced that this year we had contractors installing them. We now have residents that are begging to get their heat pumps, their air source heat pumps, which are not cold climate certified, replaced. This is their first year back in their home after they've been without a house for two years. So let's not sell, not, not allow contractors to install non-cold climate heat pumps. This is just part of a program. It should be standard. Um, the ground source heat pumps are very expensive, but man, are they amazing. If there's a way to get us to get more homes, more commercial buildings, really, really, really big buildings, we talk about 30% coming from that. Um, it's really hard to do air source um, uh, heat pumps for commercial buildings. There's limitations. We're finding that out um, with tr trying to encourage net zero building where we are. So if we can do more with that, get the knowledge out there. Uh, again, this goes back to education, people education, contractor education, community education. Because when we talk ground source heat pump, I'm like, we've been doing this in Colorado for 30 years successfully and nobody's talked about this. So when my original house was built in 92, you could have done it. Ow. Um, so the other thing I was hoping to talk about is uh, providing incentives. Um, I agree with Director Levy, if we can, like the grant money, that's going to be huge for people. Low income, 40% applicable, yes. A lot of private residential homeowners are middle income. I would really like to make a very big plea to help, we're talking about how expensive it is to uh, change over our systems. So sometimes duct work even needs to get done. It's not just as simple as like buying a new furnace system for $14,000 or $30,000. If we can find a way to help middle income folks, not just low income, I think we'll get a lot more participation, which I believe is the goal of a program like this, right, is participation. Um, and I don't know, talking about, uh, talking to the community colleges, have we communicated with, this goes back to the education piece, the Home Builders Association. They're one of the big sources for contractors to work with, and I don't know how involved they are in this mindset. Thank you. I'll just take the quick opportunity to just throw the love back at you all and your amazing staff. We would we are standing on the shoulders of giants here. You, they, we are so lucky for their passion and in, involvement in this program so far. And I'll also mention that if you, you you all have given us some amazing advice, and if you'd like to continue that, we have opportunities to participate in any way that any of you or your staff would like. We've got subcommittees for each one of those seven groups, a project management team we're working on, and um, we're always happy to just get an email or whatever you. So please contact us at any point. So thank you. Can I get a motion? Here. Absolutely. There we go. I'm trying to get to the right page. There it is. I move that we approve Dr. Cog submitting a grant application to the US EPA's Climate Pollution Reduction Implementation Grant for the Decarbonized Dr. Cog program. Dr. Sherazee has the second. Thank you very much. Uh, any final discussion? Great conversation, by the way. We're trying to keep us on time or somewhat close to that. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, nay? And any abstention? Thank you very much, and thank you for all of your work. And moving ahead uh, to the item I tried to, to jumpstart to, item number 11, discussion of state legislative issues, new bills for consideration and action. We have 35 members present and voting, so for us to take a stand uh, per our, our uh, governing documents, we would have to have 24 people to pass. So uh, as we talk, we'll, we'll deal with how we get there, but just wanted to give you those numbers. Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so as, you, as, as we have done in the past, we, we always face a little bit of an awkward 
moment in January where the board packet for the agenda goes out to you all on the same day that the legislature convenes its first day of the session. So we've we, we've worked out a board policy so that um, we can, if if there are any bills that we think are important enough that the board really needs to take uh, a position in a timely manner, we're allowed to identify those and then email them out to you two days before the board meeting, which is what happened this year. We, we've identified two bills that I'll go through real quick. And Ed and Jen, our lobbyists, are at the other end to add in anything I've misstate or forget. And then they will also have um, uh, another development from today to talk to you about when I'm done. So first of all uh, is the star of the show, is uh, Senate Bill uh, 40 that was introduced. Uh, as you can see, we uh, our matrix that's in your packet. Um, we have co-prime sponsors in the Senate, Senator Danielson and Janal, and in the House, uh, Senate, uh, Representatives Wilford and Young. This is the bill that uh, essentially reflects what we've all, uh, all of us, been talking about since this summer, uh, and and that's the. The, the fiscal issues faced by older adult, I mean, uh, AAAs and the demands on services we've seen uh, growing and some of the funding issues that we've faced. And um, it's generated so much interest um, in the Capitol that we actually have uh, legislators who came to us and said, can we carry a bill for you? So uh, we said, well, yeah. <laughs> um, we were talking to the JBC, but Let's 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 have a bill because there's a few other issues we want to uh, deal with that as well. So this bill um, starts out with um, a five million dollar appropriation to the state funding for senior services line item, which is the main uh, funding source uh, for the triple A's of, of state funds. And that's the 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 same amount that that we requested the governor put in his budget, which he didn't. Um, it, what it also does is has a couple of other pieces that addresses um, the ongoing issues and, and long-term stability issues. It's not a total uh, solution, but it's a start down that road. One provision is that it requires uh, the state to add an inflation factor every year. So this, so for the whole line item, not just the five million. So that would be adjusted for inflation each year. And then the other provision is it directs the Department of Human Services to get together with the Office of State Planning and Budgeting and the AAAs uh, this year to analyze, study, whatever the right term is, uh, the uh, adequacy of the state funding for the services that we, that, that we provide, all the AAAs around the state, and report back to the JBC and the Joint uh, Health and Human Services Committee on recommendations uh, whether or not even more is needed in the future. Uh, and then it's required to do that same process every three years so that we can have an ongoing evaluation of, of the appropriateness of state funding. Um, with that, I, I think I'll stop on that bill and see, uh, should we do these one by one, Mr. Chair, or, and, okay. So with that, I'll stop and see if anybody's got any questions. Dr. Levy. Thank you. Um, thanks, Rich, for all your work on behalf of the AAA. So it's exciting to, to talk about this, and I, I don't want to sound ungrateful for that, but, you know, inflation, this is really awkward here. Um, inflation is not necessarily the best measure for the need for growth in funds. And I, I wondered whether there's an opportunity to talk about maybe the growth in the senior population instead as, say, projected by the state sure. demographer. I think that is actually something we could talk about for sure. Absolutely, and we we did have to, we we did have early conversations about that. In the end, it it got left out. Um, but but I think um, it makes a lot of sense to to have that conversation again to see about adding that back in for sure. And it would be like the 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 growth in the over sixty population is I think what we what we could talk about. 
And maybe that and inflation, some, some two combination. Yeah. yeah, great. Professor Mella. I kind of had a similar question about the um, when, when they go through the analysis, can, can there be some type of service level that you're trying to meet? So it's not just, well, we no longer provide this service, so you guys will have enough money. Um, so it kind of goes back to just having something stronger to point to. Okay, I think that's a really good idea for sure, because we've often been in this situation where it's like we just know we're never going to have enough money to meet all the identified needs, so we kind of just try to do the best we can, and um, we've been lucky enough over the years that we've had supporters in the uh, in the governor's office at times and in the, in the legislature that said, if we have the money, we'll give it to you. <laughs> uh, but that's not the best way to, to do these things, and that's why we're at least trying to start down this path. Uh, I think that's a really good suggestion, too. Questions, comments? Feedback from our lobbyists. Do you have anything on this, or we're good? Okay. Uh, so with that, um, some municipalities have regulations on whether you can vote on something if you haven't discussed that in whatever your process is. Other municipalities, that may not be the case. Uh, others, you may have actually talked about this. So one of the things we need to find out is who would have to abstain. Uh, and we don't have a motion on the table yet, but, but we want to kind of get a, a handle on what our numbers would be. So if you could raise your hand if you would have to abstain on a motion to support this. Okay. With that, uh, I guess I would ask, so 17 would be our number to actually beat the threshold for, for us to support this. Uh, I will ask for a motion, and I guess I would suggest, uh, Director Le Levy, would you possibly have a motion that would reflect <laughs> I would, in what you were asking for? Yeah, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, I move that um, the Board of Dr. Cog support Senate Bill 40 and uh, work with the sponsors on an amendment that would include growth in the uh, population of over 60 uh, residents as protected by the state demographer as a factor for increased funding. Okay, and, and if, if you want to add hers too, that's okay. <laughs> Director Numella, do you want yours added into the motion? If others do, it's a, establishing a service level for future. Would that be one of the things we look into? Yeah. Director Teal, Dra Director Teal uh, signals he wanted a second a moment ago. Yeah, I'm going to second. <laughs> it's his birthday. It's, it's the one birthday it's my birthday gift we have for us. So any discussion on the motion before we have a vote? Is everybody clear what the two uh, suggested amendments are? Are we good? All in favor, signify by saying, oh, you got to raise your hand. Sorry, we got to, we got to, unless. Oh, any, any, anyone that will be opposing the motion? Okay, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Right. There we go. There. Thank you. Thank you. So. Now I need to see if I can, uh, it's not moving. <laughs> the next one, uh, we've only had two bills. There's only one more. Oh, I just clicked. Um, yeah, the next one, um, I didn't know this was even coming, and so it was interesting to see it when it got introduced um, on opening day. But this bill is actually like a readmission or, or a re-emergence of uh, a similar bill that passed the legislature, I think, two sessions ago. It was a, a one-time um, they call it housing tax credit for older adults, and it's targeted to lower incomes. And um, and I think it was part of a context that session where there were other um, tax credits going out and some other uh, um, refund types of approaches that were being taken. And some folks said, hey, there's nothing in, in these specifically for older adults. And so uh, a couple of legislators got together and got uh, a bill passed to essentially do pretty much the same thing here, but it was just for one year only. And then this last summer, 
there, the legislature has had an ongoing uh, summer interim committee that um, it's like, well, it's a tax commission. There, I can't remember, it's got a long formal name. So, uh, and so this bill was recommended by that bipartisan tax commission. And it's roughly the same bill uh, as that other one, except I, I'm trying to remember if this one now um, is just one year. I don't know if it says in here if it's one year or if it continues. Um, it may not say in my summary, do it. I think, no, I think it's for just the one year in my notes. Yeah, just for, just for, just for the one year again. Uh, so it would be another uh, tax credit, uh, as I said, um, focused on um, moderate to lower incomes as a benefit. And um, it, was, it was needless to say very popular when it, when it passed uh, the last time. And so we, we thought we would recommend uh, support for the bill. Uh, this year as, as another way to um, in, increase some resources uh, for our older adults. If I can do the same thing real quick, how many folks would have to abstain from a vote on this item? Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Rich, uh, I had a question about this one. So would it only be applicable to people who either don't own property, in other words, seniors who are renting, or those who have moved and haven't lived in their home for 10 years, uh, or I guess maybe who have failed to file for the senior property oh. tax exemption? I think, I mean, I was, I was gonna say, it, 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 it clearly says it's not eligible or you're not eligible if you claim the senior property tax exemption. Right. So I don't know if that ex if, if that's the same thing you were saying, just different. Okay. <laughs> or if it if it says um, if you because I think under current law, if you had qualified for the exemption and moved, you can't apply. Right. You can't get the exemption anyway. So I think you'd qualify for this. Makes sense. So I think there'd be a larger group of people, presumably, that could get this. It's just those who get the senior property tax exemption that don't. It wouldn't get this. That would not take, get Thanks this. Thanks for right. the clarification. You did just the microphone on thing. Uh, do we have a motion? Director Shaw. Thank you. I'm happy to move that uh, the Dr. Cog Board of Directors support HB 1052. Director Sandgren, is one of your final acts? Okay, <laughs> seconded by Director Sandgren. Thank you very much. Any final discussion? Okay, uh, and anyone that will oppose this uh, motion to support? Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed nay? Okay, there we go. Thank you. So I want to turn it over to our lobbyists who have, I think, I think some pretty exciting information to provide for you. And Thank it you, relates Rich. to the uh, Area Agency on Aging Funding Issues. Thank you, Rich, and Mr. Chair, members. Um, so in late December, there was a provider in the... Ed, is that mic on? Should be. I okay, think so. maybe it is. Okay. In late December, there was a provider... I believe in Adams County, who stopped providing meals to seniors. And Adams County, the county commissioner, stepped up and provided some money. But there was a big article last week in the Colorado Sun about state funding for seniors, what happens if a provider um, ends service in the middle of a fiscal year. The Joint Budget Committee talked about this in late December as well. And Rich and Jennifer and I decided we would be a little proactive in at least suggesting to them that maybe we need a statutory contingency fund where the Department of Human Services could have some amount of money to meet emergencies, not to address the waiting list, because that's a separate issue. But if you have a provider providing services, and for whatever reason, within statutory guidelines, there's a disruption of services, the Department of Human Services could provide some funding um, on an emergency basis. 
The Joint Budget Committee has discussed this issue twice today. They voted unanimously to draft a bill to move that forward. The bill will be brought back to them for further con one final consideration, and if they approve it unanimously, then it would be introduced. So at the next Dr. Cog board meeting, we hope to be able to give you more information about that. But we felt it was a good thing to do to give the department the ability to do that. The legislature may not even be in session when there's an emergency like this, and this gives the Department of Human Services a limited amount of ability to address those, those circumstances. Great news. Thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Mr. Rex. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yep. Yes, thank you very much. No, we're, seriously, we're so appreciative of, of, uh, of the JVC really stepping up and, and doing this. Um, I, and, and there has been, you know, a lot of, a lot of attention to that Adams County uh, situation particular, as, as Ed mentioned, um, major props to, uh, to uh, Adams County Commission and stepping up to, to fill that void. But this is, you know, th this might have been a high profile um, uh, situation, but it is not the only one, right? And we're going to see a lot more of this, quite frankly. And unfortunately, um, you know, because, you know, funding's just not keeping pace, right? And it, it's difficult for these nonprofits to, to kind of prop themselves up. So we're we're really appreciative of the understanding of, of legislators that they that they're starting to get it right that we that this is this is not something that we're just saying that this is real life and uh, so appreciative of Jen and Ed and and Rich and Jayla and everybody else who keeps pushing this message so I just wanted to share that with you all thank you sir thank you very much anything else that's it thank you thank you very much we so appreciate the work you do Director Odorizio. I just want to say thank you to everyone who's uh, come together. Dr. Cog has been phenomenal in trying to make sure that we keep the continuity of those services going. I also appreciate our lobbyists working on this issue. I think what we're going to see is that there is this cliff coming, and as we approach this end of big dollars, big ARPA money, CARES money, um, some nonprofits are not prepared for that transition, and so I think uh, looking ahead, we're going to start to see more and more of these nonprofits uh, come to us and, and find out that they're not prepared. And those who are prepared, great. That's what nonprofits are supposed to do is try to focus on sustainability. Uh, but it does not mean that you're not going to experience some sort of degradation or loss of certain services. So I would recommend, based on the lessons that we've learned recently, that uh, reach out to your nonprofit infrastructure and start uh, finding out how truly uh, healthy they are and try to stay ahead of it because reacting is uh, after the fact is a very difficult situation. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, too. Uh, Director Rex already mentioned the informational items, so I won't repeat those, but uh, call those to your attention to the packet. Mr. Chair. Way over here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I realize we're, we're not supposed to be discussing these informational items. I did have a couple of comments I wanted to make on the Please. federal um, legislative issues. There were three, and I just want to introduce them and put them on the table and see if, if there is interest in trying to, uh, to make some modifications. Again, not tonight. I realize we're already over time. But when I was reading through them, um, one, one thing that caught my eye that I was a little concerned about, and maybe, maybe there is no cause for concern, but um, this item under, um, as it happens, older adults, and um, providing a path for private sector investment in Older American Act services. And the reason that caught my eye is because when InnovAge, which is a PACE provider, um, went from not-for-profit to for-profit, um, there w were immediately problems with services. And I think this is not something I would want us to encourage, I, and I don't know the background on this provision, and I don't know what people had in mind and what, you know, what uh, assurances that we won't see a repeat of InnovAge, but, you know, we're seeing this a lot with nursing homes and things uh, that are, uh, private for-profit, so um, it, this just says private sector, and I interpreted that to mean for-profit. So there's just something to flag that maybe we could talk about at a future meeting. Um, and and the second item, it's it's not in here, but it's something I, I don't have a suggestion on, but I think I've I've raised this. 
um, some time ago where in Boulder County, we saw one of the few remaining assisted living facilities that accept Medicaid um, close that that aspect of their services. And it's a not-for-profit. It, it's, um, I think it may be, um, it may be de denominational, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, they, they found, it, you know, there's no blame to assign there. It's the low Medicaid reimbursement rates and the fact that Medicaid wasn't reimbursing for a lot of the services that, that these um, low-income seniors in assisted living need. And so it just was not a financially sustainable model. And many of the residents had to move a long way out of Boulder County in order to be rehoused, you know, leaving their family, their social network, their medical providers, all of that. So that's another one. I don't have a, I don't have an, you know, the language and the idea, but I think this is going to be a growing crisis across the country, and we really need to start thinking about that. And then the last one is just in the. Um, in the uh, transportation funding section where it talks about front range passenger rail, yay, we got half a million dollars for the corridor identification program. But it talks about directing appropriation um, to, the, um, to Amtrak, basically. And we have not, and Director Peck is, is uh, on the board as well as um, we, and Director Mulvey, we have not selected an operator and and so Amtrak isn't the entity that needs the money for this it's actually the federal rail administration so that's just an easy little wording fix so thank you for indulging me and letting me have a little bit of time executive director Rex mr. chair thank thank you for the opportunity um I'll probably touch base with you a little bit afterwards uh, maybe we streamline some of that language a little too much most notably on, on the private sector thing I'll talk to you about that specifically but I think we're really referring to the opportunity to do public private partnerships like with insurance companies for example um, because you know the community-based services that we provide and offer um, they see value in that and to reducing the, their costs and there's opportunity there for, for us to, to partner with insurance companies on the funding side um, not, not the services side okay yeah, we can talk about it more yeah and I'd be happy to participate <laughs> Thank you very much. Moving ahead to committee reports. The chair requests these reports be brief, reflect decisions made, and information germane to the business of Dr. Cog. We start with the report for the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Mr. Nicholas Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Stack met in January earlier this month. Uh, I'll touch on three items discussed. First up was a uh, overview of multimodal planning at CDOT, uh, including an overview of the partner plan, um, planning partner and public engagement. Also spoke about the uh, asset management program at CDOT. Uh, uh, it's included both state and federal requirements. Uh, currently, CDOT's rank for pavement condition is quite low. Unsurprisingly, additional funds needed uh, to receive a higher rank nationally on that. And then final item I'll touch on, Colorado Freight, freight, freight Plan Overview. Uh, this is a plan outlining strategies to address issues and enhance the safety and mobility of freight. Uh, also includes uh, maintenance, economic vitality, sustainability, and resilience. Next steps on this plan include uh, FHWA approval of the freight investment plan, which includes a project list anticipated in March 2024. Uh, end of report. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, now a report from the Metro Mayor's Caucus, Mayor Bud Starker, Director Starker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. The uh, caucus has not met since our last meeting, but we do plan to meet on February 7th, so I do expect to have a report next month. And that's my presentation. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, my understanding is no report from the Metro Area County Commissioners, is that correct? MAC did not meet since our last meeting of the board. Next oh. meeting is 9.30 uh, this Friday in this room. Oh, upstairs, apologies. Oh, tell him it's in this room. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. I got shoot. There, there I got is, you a Southern Shooting Partnership, so no sweat. There is likewise no report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, uh, but I will mention, as I mentioned at our last meeting, uh, one of the, the stalwarts of, of the ACA and, and former Dr. Cog board member Kathy Noon, uh, the celebration of her life is tomorrow at 2 o'clock. 
and uh, hope to see some of you there at that uh, celebration of Kathy's life. So I wanted to, to remember that and, and make that mention. Uh, report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And just on that Kathy Noon note, for those that are interested, um, it is at the Embassy Seats Ballroom in uh, Centennial at, at 10250 East Costilla Avenue. Um, it's right next to Top Golf, in case anybody knows that. So, so we uh, all all are encouraged. We'd love to see you there. Uh, okay. So, uh, Regional Air Quality Council. We met on January 5th. Pretty quiet meeting for us. We just got a recap of kind of year-end stuff uh, related to um, the various um, uh, programs run by RAC, and we also got a recap on the Air Quality Control Commission's December 2023 actions and their schedule for uh, for the upcoming year, looking at um, uh, the possibility of trying to schedule some uh, control control measures, control strategy recommendations from the RAC, so that, which will be later in 2024. That's it, that's it Mr. Thank you very much. Report from the E-470 Authority, Director Mulvey. Yeah, we focused on administrative matters. I'm pleased to report that the board president this year will be Director Dyack again by unanimous vote and that the other uh, officer positions remain as before. And secondly, uh, there were new members uh, from municipalities who we don't always see, including a bunch from Jeffco, and that was interesting and refreshing. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, report from the Colorado Department of Transportation. Darius Pakbaz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, wanted to first note, uh, with the challenging weather over this long weekend, wanted to note the uh, amazing work that the uh, the crews did out there, both at the state and local level, on keeping the roads open and uh, making sure folks were able to get home safely or whatever they needed to do a travel, especially in the high country. The Transportation Commission was uh, Commission workshop was held today, and the meeting will be held tomorrow. Today at the workshop, there was various budget amendments, including one for a request for $1.78 million to repair the C-470 overpass bridge over I-70 that was struck by a vehicle um, carrying a large temporary building. So that... Um, that is going to be up for the commission's approval tomorrow. Additionally, the uh, presentations that were uh, mentioned at, uh, earlier at the stack meeting were given to the Transportation Commission as well uh, to kind of kick off the statewide planning process, which will go more into um, with the commission and internally with staff later on this year. And finally, there was an update on the upcoming state freight and uh, state freight and passenger rail plan, which is close to adoption um, uh, in the next couple of months. Um, also want to mention tomorrow they are going to open the statewide planning rules per the requirements of House Bill 231101 to explore any potential boundary changes and administrative changes for um, transportation planning regions and the stack. Uh, and Mr. Chair, that concludes my report and I'm open to any questions board members have. Thank you very much. Uh, moving ahead, report to the Regional Transportation District, uh, Bill Surratt. Sur Saroy. Saroy, I apologize. Yeah, thanks. Um, Welcome. Just a couple of things focusing on our new um, fare changes that we just implemented in January or January 2nd. Um, positive feedback so far, obviously, lower fares, uh, people do like that, so we um, are encouraged by that. Um, some of the other things that we'll be doing on the fare side, we will be expanding our LIVE program, our low-income program, um, the, in terms of the, the uh, level or the, the income qualifications and some other things. So that will be occurring next month because we had to go through some um, issues and, and challenges with the state in terms of the, there are people that qualify the income uh, by income. And, and also associated with that, we will be starting a new um, transit assistant grant program for nonprofits, and that will provide f uh, potential for grants for free fare media for nonprofits that serve people with immediate needs or emergencies. So we will be providing that, standing up that program in the next month or two, so you can look out for that as well. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, administrative items, uh, if you didn't get your parking pass, remember to get that. If you parked downstairs in the garage, you have to go through the building because you won't be able to get in if you go outside and back to the stores. So there's kind of a, a meandering hallway that, you know, we, we lose about 10% of the board every meeting that way. It's, it's how we get some turnover. Uh, 
<laughs> well, we have alternates, exactly. Uh, so would, it would encourage you, well, you need to go that way if, if you park there. Uh, there will be staff at the exit of the parking garage too to help because these can be kind of challenging sometimes to get there. Yeah, I was just going to say for new members, um, so, so just exit through, so you want to go out the Rappahoe County, Rappahoe County, Rappahoe Street <laughs> side. And um, we'll ask that you give like the, the ticket you, you got when you came in as well as the validation. And we'll just hand those to the security guy downstairs and, and he'll let you out. Right. Our uh, next meeting, our workshop, February 7th. Our next board meeting is Wednesday, February 21st. Are there other matters by members? Dr. Nermella. I just, um, my alternate was here, Claire Carmelia, and she wasn't, um, acknowledged during the initial, so I don't, I'm not sure if she's officially in there, but I just want to, she may be subbing for me for next month, so I want to make sure she's actually in the book. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other matters by members? Thank you all for all you do in your communities and here with Dr. Cog, and thank you to the Dr. Cog staff. You rock. Have a good night. Meeting adjourned.